Hey everybody, my name is Aaron Gallagher from the Gospel Broadcasting Network uh, on GBN. Uh, I'm on shows like the Authentic Christian Podcast and Answering the Air with Don Blackwell. And today, uh, this video is actually a public discussion that I had with uh, a guy named Trey Fisher. Now, how this discussion came about uh, on the show Answering the Air, uh, viewers will submit videos to Don and I and say, hey, we saw this video, we'd like you to take a look at it and review it and see if you think what they're teaching is biblical, if it's correct. And so we do that. Well, before uh, we film the episode reviewing this particular video, um, we always try to reach out to the people personally and discuss with them privately. And so the video that was submitted to us was an episode of the show called Cultish. And um, Jeremiah and Andrew are the hosts of Cultish, and they had someone named Trey, a Trey Fisher, who was their guest. And so this particular episode was discussing the Churches of Christ. And so Trey, uh, being a member of the Churches of Christ for, I think, about 18 years before he left, Trey was their special guest. And so throughout this episode, you know, Trey puts forth his case as to what the Church of Christ teaches in his uh, view and whether it's right or not. And so we reached out to these people. I did talk with Jeremiah through email. Um, we went back and forth a couple times, very friendly. Jeremiah was a friendly guy. And I also reached out personally to Trey uh, Fisher. And Trey and I uh, had a lot of conversations, a couple via phone, and then a couple actually on Zoom. And uh, we became friends. We bonded over some um, enjoyment of DIY projects. Uh, we both are passionate about that. And so uh, we talked about that a lot. Uh, but we both agreed, uh, even though we like each other as people, we agreed that we think the, the, the other is teaching a false gospel. Um, and we talked about Galatians 1, 6 through 9. He thinks I am teaching a false gospel, and I believe that he's teaching a false gospel. And so after a few conversations privately, we decided, hey, why don't we have a public conversation that others can see, where we each present our sides, and then let people uh, see the arguments and choose for themselves uh, which they think is, is teaching the truth. And so uh, before we review this show on answering the error, um, we're going to be doing that here in the next few days. Uh, we did want to have and, and put this discussion publicly. So Trey had me as a guest uh, on his uh, podcast. And it's called the Parish Reformed Podcast. And so I appreciate him having me on his show. And we mainly discussed the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Um, we started to get into Acts chapter 2 at the end of it. Hopefully we'll pick up uh, and discuss that, finish that topic in the next video. But um, hopefully you'll open up your Bibles. I know Trey would, would wish that you do the same thing as I would. Open up your Bibles. Uh, watch this discussion. And please, you know, be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, who were listening to an inspired apostle, Paul, and yet they still search the scriptures to see if those things being taught to them was true. So we hope you'll grab your, your Bible, sit down and enjoy this discussion. And uh, hopefully the truth will set you free, like Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 32. We thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the discussion. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching this episode of the Parish Reformed uh, podcast. I've got a buddy of mine named Aaron Gallagher. He reached out to me a while back. Uh, we've had some good discussions. Um, he is a member of the Church of Christ, and um, I want to introduce him to the show. We're going to have a lot of, hopefully, a lot of discussions on a lot of different topics. This one, um, he reached out, wants to talk about baptism mainly. We might get on some other uh, rabbit trails, uh, but we'll try to bring it back into baptism. Um, but Aaron, so tell everybody how we met. Yeah, so thanks for having me, man. Um, yeah. So we, we met, you know, whenever you were a guest on the Cultist show, I had a lot of people who'd send me the video and say, have you seen this? And so I watched through it. And, um, you know, there's a program on GBN, I think I've told you about before, called Answering the Error, where people submit videos to us and we review them. And we're always, you know, like, I mean, like, I think our conversations have been cordial, but like we're honest. And so, you know, I reached out to you and you were like, I'd love to discuss, which is cool because you're actually the first person of all of the answer in the airs that have had like an actual discussion, like mm -hmm. offline. And then I guess recorded now because, you know, the cat, we've done a lot of videos on different groups and most scare of the time, them, Aaron. they're scared well, of you. I, man, I'll show they're you the message. Of you. It's really nice. I'm always like, Hey, like we disagree, but I'll be cordial. Like I try to, you know, anyway, they're scared. Yeah. Man. So I reached out to you and, um, and you responded. And so we had two Zoom conversations previous to this where, you know, the first one we told each other about our backgrounds. And I talked about me growing up, being a member of the church. And then when I moved to North Carolina after I graduated college and I was working in the secular world in the like biotech field, um, 
that I had sort of, in my description, looking back, I would say that I had been unfaithful to Jesus and left the church. You know, I was still showing up, you know, Sunday mornings from time to time, mainly because I knew my dad was going to call me at like 1245 and say, hey, what did the preacher preach on this morning? And I wasn't going to lie to my dad. So, but, um, so I basically had what I would look back and say left the church and had been studying scripture mainly at one point to sort of prove that the church of Christ, I thought they were wrong on what they taught about baptism specifically. And um, when I was telling you about my background, I think maybe in the initial texting or Facebook messaging, I said, you know, that Acts 22, 16 was a big one for me. And you'd say, well, I'll help you with Acts 22, 16. I was like, well, let's talk. And so that sort of led to us having, you know, that first and then another discussion after that. And um, I just thought, like we said yesterday on the phone when we talked, we talked about your DIY house and your awesome looking floors and stuff. And then we talked about how, like, why can't we just have a similar discussion to what we already had previously? Like, talk about, you know, these passages like Acts 22 and Acts 2 and, and start there. And then, like you said, you know, eventually have other discussions on once saved, always saved and stuff like that. So at least people can see what each one of our sides position is. And then, like you said on the phone yesterday, probably stealing your thunder, but like, let those people look at our presentations and say, which one do they think aligns with scripture, you know, because ultimately that's all you can do is give people the information and then hope, you know, let them choose, you know. Can you still hear me? You're, I can't hear you. I accidentally muted myself again. I'm not doing that again. I'm glad you caught me soon. So let me, ask, okay. you a, let me ask you a question. Could you, could you hear me? All right. Yeah, I can hear you fine. So okay, good. Um, it was my fault. I hit, I hit the mute button. Oh, yeah, I didn't want to fine. interrupt you. Um, so let me ask you a question. Going, once I got going, it's going to be a while. So yeah. So here's my question. Okay. Aaron, yes. My friend from Memphis. Yes. My, my friend who's a church of Christ minister. Yes. Do you think I preach a false gospel? Uh, I do. Oh, uh, and I, 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 I'm not dealing with you no more. <laughs> well, that's, that's what we talked about before is like, the conversations we've had, like you're upfront and honest. And I respect that to say, Aaron, I think, you know, you think I teach false gospel and I think that you teach one, mm -hmm. but like, we're still like, we still have discussions about it in a cordial way. Right. You know, you know, I'm not, some gonna... people can't, I mean, they just get mad and just holler, but I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're, you're a big boy and you can handle me saying the same thing you just said to me. Hey, Aaron, I believe you preach a false gospel, a gospel of works based salvation, the Galatian heresy. Right. Yeah. And so, but you take it and let's, let's just sit down and discuss it. Right. Because if you're really wanting truth and you really think you're right. Yeah. I think I'm right. Then let's go to the word and let's just see what it says. And hopefully if you're right, hopefully God brings me back to the churches of Christ. But I don't think I'm wrong. I think I'm right. Yeah. So I yeah. pray that God opens your heart and eyes to see the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and takes you out of the church of Christ and stop preaching the false gospel. But I'm going to warn you, it's going to cost you. Sure. So here's the deal. Christianity, you know, to be a Christian, it costs you nothing because Christ did it all. But on the other hand, it costs you everything, right? And so you're going to lose a lot of friends and family and your, probably your job because you work at a church of Christ organization and a church and everything like that. So yeah. I pray that um, you count the cost. But, you know, I wonder, too, if the reason that we're able, I mean, I know you have lots of conversations with people. I think back to my, my life, my life, I'm 38 now. When I was in my 20s, I taught guitar on YouTube. 45. You're 45. Okay. So I taught guitar on YouTube. And I remember the first comment, somebody was like, you are the worst guitar teacher ever. And it's like, you I'm like, no, I'm not. I know lots of people that, you know, like the keyboard warrior. But then like as time went on, I got more used to people disagreeing and like you get used to it, the more you do it. Same with Bible discussions. The more people you talk to, the less like, I guess, defensive you get maybe. Mm -hmm. So like, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I mean, it's not that this stuff isn't like super important to both of us, right. but I think we've had so many discussions with people that and we're able right. to. The more you do it, right? The more you do it. Because yeah. Because like yesterday, you're like, you want me to send you some, the questions that I might ask? I'm like, no. Like, yeah. if I don't know what you're going to say by now, wow, you know? So, yeah. I will say this. I did watch uh, a few of your episodes. Um, well, I didn't. I watched one with Todd Wagner, right? Yes. Uh, out of Watermark. Todd Wagner is one of my mentors. Good friend of mine. Yeah. Solid, dude. 
And so y'all broke up uh, his his little, I think it was, uh, he doesn't do it anymore, but it was uh, Real Truth real quick. So it's like yeah, any question truth. under five minutes, here we go. Yeah. And so he was talking about this, you know, I think the question is, do you have to be baptized to be saved? And so he gave a quick five minute response and y'all broke that down. And man, I was just like, I'll be honest with you. I was like, man, I almost want to break down your side of you breaking him down. And yeah. uh, just some inconsistencies there and, and some some standards. Well, I would, I mean, I would broken. encourage, it, it yeah. wouldn't, you know, the way that show, that's answering the error, the way that show came about and we decided to pick a real subtle title, right? And <laughs> no, we're trying to be like open and honest and clear, but somebody, a young person submitted that video to us and said, hey, I saw mm-hmm. this video and it was raising questions. You know, I don't know how to answer these things. You know, what would you think? And so, of course, Don Blackwell and myself watched it and we felt like, we could answer those arguments, you know? And so yeah. we did our review of it and I'd encourage you, man, go, you know, go yeah. for it. That's I think we, funny. I think me and Jeremiah, the apologetic dog might do that. Yeah. Yeah. Another Nortier. one though. Here's another Nortier. one. Go ahead. Am I saying that right? Nortier? Nortier. Yeah. Nortier. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to say it right. Yeah. Uh, Nortier, Nortier, whatever. Right. The dog. Uh, so another one I tried to watch yeah. was you and two, two young guys on the side. And uh, it was about Calvinism. Figured and, that would yeah, I, I tried to, I tried to watch it, Aaron, and I got about five minutes into it, and I was just like, man, this is so bad, I can't watch it. You know, it's just, it was just very, it was just bad. There were some things you like, feel mis- do you feel like it was misrepresenting Calvinism, or do you think it was what, like, well, what was I mean, the, you know, when you talk about the the uh, tulip, right? Yeah, uh, that's fine. I mean, what, what you said was accurate and true. It's okay. it's not that; it's the understanding. Of, okay. of it and the explanation of it. Um, and so there are some things in there, which I mean, maybe we, me and you go through Tulip for yeah. the next month or two and yeah. chop it up, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd be down. So let's get into this one. Awesome. We've only, so here's the deal. Whoever's watching this, this might take three hours, but what we've decided to do is I'm going to send this to Aaron. I'll have it on mine. He'll have it on his. He can chop it up however he wants, but if it's three hours, I'm thinking most people won't want to watch three hours solid. So I'll probably break it into a bunch of segments of 30 minutes, you know, or 45 minutes, just sure. finding some good breaks within that time frame, and post them so you can watch them, number them, part one, two, three, four, whatever it is. And sure. I'll also put the whole thing up there. Just if somebody wants to sit down for three hours, get after it. I'm um, at it. Glutton yeah. for punishment. Yeah, glutton <laughs> for punishment. But then that way you'll know that – the context you can you can watch it throughout the whole thing or we'll just break it i know i'll probably will break it up into 30 to 45 minutes if we can find some good breaks within that time frame aaron what are you thinking about doing with this long discussion Uh, whatever i mean if if you want to break it into 30 minutes i can do the same thing yeah you know i mean you can do what you want i'm saying like that's why i'm giving it to you the only thing is some people will take what i say take a little clip of 15 seconds out of its context of the whole thing yeah. And just do that for hours and days and weeks. But yeah. I don't think you're going to do that. No, I don't. But, I, I don't have the, I guess the desire and I probably don't have the time. Like, exactly. You know, I don't have so the time for that. Yeah. if you so, do 30 minutes, I might do like 29. No, I'm just kidding. Right. I'll, I'll do whatever you do. Yeah. So you wanted today discuss and to start this whole um, long discussions of all different kind of topics. You want to talk today about baptism uh, yeah. so where do you want to start? What do you want to talk about? Well, I guess maybe I'd love to start in the passage that I had talked about, uh, in, I guess in the intro, but then the one that me and you started talking about, which was, you know, Acts mm-hmm. and, um, well, not just Acts, but Acts 22. And really, I guess in a bigger, um, a bigger pattern, Saul's conversion. Um, because, you know, like when I look at first Timothy one, um, yeah. verse 14 is where it starts. And so I, first I mean, Timothy one 14. Yeah. Yeah. So real quick before we start, because we've yeah. got a lot of time here, right? Yeah. I, I was chuckling when you said three hours, because I was thinking like most people think that's a long time, but you and I know like Bible. Oh, no, that'll, that'll, that'll fly by. And this that's is what I like. Let's just just do this periodically when we can and have the time and talk about whatever, however yeah. long. So let me ask you this real quick. Church of Christ, yeah. what type of Church of Christ are you? Okay. Uh, because here's, so, here's why I asked that, Aaron. Is because sure. when I was on Cultish, and Cultish Part 2 is coming up in a few weeks, a week or two, uh, okay. where I answer objections from that. And some of those of your questions, we talked we talked to each other before I even went on that show. So yeah. to let people know, 
yeah. we talked. Um, yeah. So I, the lot of, you know, everything I get from is, well, you don't represent the Church of Christ. That's not accurate. That's not what the Church of Christ believes. And I'm like, I think it's going to be really hard to throw a blanket and cover everyone in the Church of Christ. So yeah. when I say Church of Christ, what I really mean is you believe that you are born perfect and not born a sinner. Would you agree with that? I agree, okay. yeah. You, you believe that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. You have to, like, baptism is where you have the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit, and you have to be baptized to be saved, and you can lose your yeah. salvation. Yeah, you contact the blood, and we'll get into that. And yeah. yeah, and then I do believe that you can lose your salvation, fall from grace, if you walk away, you right. know, from... Yeah, so yeah. that's what I mean by the Church of Christ, because if I even started asking you, hey, Aaron, are you a one cupper or multiple cups? Yeah. You would, yeah. You would answer one way or the other, and yeah. I, don't even, I don't even want to expose you in that, but by you answering that... I would say multiple cups because I think the, you know, I think it's in first Corinthians 10, Paul's right into Corinth. He's in Ephesus and he says mm -hmm. the cup, the cup that we drink. I mean, he's not mm -hmm. drinking, they're not running that cup across the Mediterranean. But you some know? people think that, right? And so there's, you have church oh, yeah. of Christ who are one cup and yeah. multiple cups. And so they would say, yeah. well, Aaron, you don't represent the church of Christ. If I yeah. asked you, do you have a, your fellowship hall, is it connected to the building or not? It is. Do you have yeah. a kitchen or not? Right. And so you have all these little things that separate the church of Christ where they could always scream, well, you don't represent the church of Christ. So let's just keep it base level. Oh, yeah. Ahead. And I, you know, well, what I was going to say is, you know, churches of Christ, you know this, but maybe some people are watching don't know that, that churches of Christ are autonomous. You know, they're led by, you know, elders. And of course, you know, I don't know if you would agree on this, but in the Bible, the word elder, uh, you know, the word elder, bishop, presbyter, I would even say pastor in, in Ephesians 4.11, mm -hmm. which is the only only place that they didn't translate the Latin word, the Greek word poimen, into shepherd. It did everywhere else except 411. Anyway, the, the church is governed by that group if there are faithful men. Right. And so, you know, with churches of Christ being autonomous, you sort of hit the nail on the head, which is, you know, I've known just that have Church of Christ on the building that teach stuff that, you know, I mean, that would be, I would consider unfaithful too. Mm -hmm. And so when I read the New Testament, you know, I think that that New Testament church went by many different names, but all of them were identified with Christ, you know, right. so Church of God, the Church of Christ, the, you know, First Timothy 316, Hebrews 12, 23, et cetera. Well, we're, um, we're, you know, so I'm a pastor of, you know, a church plant that we planted here in Louisiana. It's called the Parish of the Redeemer. Uh, right. Louisiana has parishes, okay. you know, not counties, and but a parish is a, a church, a group of okay. believers, right? Okay. So we're the parish or a church of the Redeemer. Who's the Redeemer? Jesus would be the Redeemer. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, like, you know, I would say um, with regard, churches of Christ are autonomous. Um, you know, so what that just means is that they're led by elders. And so, you know, you can go to one city and have an eldership there that I would say isn't following, you know, the biblical mm -hmm. pattern. And so, like you said, you know, it's hard. It's sort of hard to to drop a blanket statement and say, well, the Church of Christ doesn't teach. I mean, look, I know churches of Christ that worship with the instrumental music, which I would think doesn't stick to the biblical pattern. And that'll probably be one of our topics sometime down the road. But so, yeah, the Church of Christ are autonomous. You know, I, I'm not a representative by any means for the Churches of Christ. I'm just, a, you know, a member. Um, but if you ask me what would I like fit into, I'm not um, non-institutional, which non-institutional would be the ones that believe it's just one cup and you can't have a fellowship hall um, based off first Corinthians 11, which you need know, 23 and following Lord's supper, which I think is a passage. That's not, that's not what it means in context, but right. um, I'm not that I would be what some people call maybe mainstream. You know, it's always like everyone that's more conservative than you calls you a liberal and everyone that's mm -hmm. more liberal than you calls you a conservative. Oh, so yeah, yeah so anyway, but, let's, we covered uh, that. So bottom yeah. line is Aaron doesn't even represent all the church of Christ. So I would I would say that I will present the case for what I think is the biblical view, the biblical of course, church. Of Christ. But then, but, but what I'm, my yeah. point is, but they would too. They would say, no, ours is the yeah. biblical view, and you can't have a kitchen in the worship center. And then I would discuss it with them, you know. Yeah. Right, but, but they they would say, well, you're wrong. Yeah, and you're yeah. a liar. So some have some have changed their position. So you know, right. but to each so let's their get own. into it. So baptism, let's get right. back into it. So we the oh, okay. So First Timothy uh, one fourteen. Um, Okay. I'll just read it. Uh, the, it's Paul writing, obviously, to Timothy. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Set, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Uh, acceptance. 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, ESV, chief, other translations. Verse 16, but I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life, right? So, you know, Paul here in verse 16 says that he was an example to those who were to believe in him uh, for eternal life. I think the New King James even says, I don't have it linked. Let me link it in my logos real quick. Uh, so when I go to one passage, it goes to the other. Uh, all right, do I have it? First Timothy. That's an interesting verse right there. However, yeah, okay, so this is the New King James, or the yeah, New King James, where it says, uh, show all long suffering or patience as a pattern. Um, that word, you know, is like, Tupon, uh, hupo under the pattern. So basically, you know, what I think Paul's saying in that verse is Paul's saying to Timothy, hey, you know, the way that I became a Christian is mm -hmm. the way that all people would become a Christian. I think we agree that all people become Christians the same way. There's not like this person became a Christian this way and this person was saved a different way. Um, and I'm going to qualify that in the new covenant. Um, now, I will say that people are always saved by faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 shows that. Um, Abraham, well. by that's oh, where we're going to talk. Exactly. So, yeah. Because it's like, I know you don't believe that, but I know you have to say that under the Christian umbrella. You have to say that, but you don't really believe it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But okay. so your so, point here in 1 Timothy 1, 14 through 16. Paul's a pattern. That's, that's the point of verse 16 is that Paul is a pattern or a type for how other people become Christians. And so, you know, a lot of times these discussions on baptism get into, you know, even ours, Romans, you know, Romans 5, 1, you know, uh, justified by faith, we have peace with God. Or 1 Corinthians 1, uh, Christ sent me not to baptize. Or Ephesians 2, 8, by grace mm -hmm. through faith, by works, right? And so all of those are written by who? Paul. Are written by Paul, right? So, yeah, obviously the Holy Spirit is the one that inspired it. And that message came, John 16, 12 through 15, from Jesus, a God from the Father. So, yeah, God the Father giving the message Jesus to the Holy Spirit, to the inspired writer. But... When I look at the New Testament, a lot of times in my discussions, most of the objections to baptism come from those epistles of Paul's. And so I always like to say, well, Paul's obviously not going to write something in Ephesians uh, that contradicts how he became a Christian in Acts. Mm -hmm. And so, so anyway, I think that it's nice to look at Acts because if you see how Paul became a Christian, then you can say, okay, well, obviously that's, that doesn't contradict with Ephesians 2 or 1 Corinthians 1, et cetera. So I'm going to get into it. I'm so long-winded. You love, you, love, you love Paul's conversion, how Paul became a Christian, right? Yeah. And how Paul and became I, righteous. Right? Yeah. And see, Because if I we think can figure I, that one out, because you know, your point is here, look, I just want to make this point real quick while we're here. I receive mercy for this reason, right? That in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to, who, look at that, who were to believe in him. Sure. For eternal life, not be baptized yeah. in him. That word believe, like, that's what we're going to talk about. Because see, here's, here's the yeah. deal. It's always a battle for definitions of words, my friend. And so we're going to talk I about agree. these words. So if he's an example to those who were to believe. Now we're getting into even another doctrine that we can talk about later. Who yeah. were to believe believe sure. in him, who's the him there, Jesus, for what? Yeah. Eternal life. Now you would yeah. say, no, you that's Paul, what he meant where there is who were to be baptized in him for eternal life. But you're gonna play games with that word believe. I'm not gonna I'm gonna hold you to the fire, my friend Bub. I'm gonna hold right, you that. to the fire. You ready? I like s'mores. Yeah. Uh, you like it? Because oh. that's what we're gonna do. So you're yeah, and, Paul. But yeah, so so anyway, I would say okay, Paul says that that basically he was an example to those who were to believe in him. And I don't have any, I agree with you that he's talking about people who would believe in Jesus for eternal life after Paul. So like Paul was an example. I'm not saying people, but he wasn't the first person saved that way. But I think a lot of times, like you go to a passage like John three and we can right. argue about the meaning. I'm just, I want to stop okay. you because this, this is what I want to, I just want to hold you. Yes. But you don't really believe that those who believe in him will get eternal life. Right. I mean, like, but that's not going to bring do. eternal life. Yeah, I do. Right. I mean, there's a few things. Number so you don't one, have to be baptized. Uh, no, you have to be baptized. Oh. So, I mean, if I'm allowed to elaborate, First Timothy one sixteen believes in the present tense, which means mm -hmm. you know, present tense means continual. No doubt. No doubt. Right. 100%. Yeah. So, so I would say, um, you know, if you look throughout the New Testament, there's lots of um, different references to 
um, like, uh, what is it? Acts eleven eighteen, right? Uh, Acts eleven eighteen talks about, um, repentance unto life, right? You know, these passages. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess the overall thing is, yeah, I, I think, what does Paul mean by believe in him for eternal life? Does he mean as soon as you have faith, you are automatically forgiven of your sins? Or is Paul using what, you know, this word, and we can discuss it if you want. Um, we can discuss it now or later, but synecdoche, which is, um, it's a figure of speech. Um, you, do you hold, I'm assuming you do the grammatico historical mm-hmm. hermeneutic. Yeah. 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 So not to get into, let me say this quickly. You already know this, but the grammatical historic, uh, historical method, um, of interpretation basically talks about grammatically. You take a look at what the words meant at the time it was written in that culture. Right. So what did, you know, the word, I'm trying to think of a, a word. It doesn't matter. What did that word mean in the Greek, uh, at the time that it was written? right? That's what lexicon, that's why we look to a Greek lexicon for a definition, not, you know, Merriam-Webster, a modern definition. And then historically, you know, we take into account the historical background of the author, right? What does so, that understand? Right. Yeah. And in, in the grammatical, if you study, like, I know you have hermeneutics books, I got more than I need um, and more than I've read, but um, I've read some of them where it says the grammatical essence is it says you should allow figures of speech. I mean, we allow figures of speech, simile, metaphor, hyperbole, synecdoche that we talk those ways and in, in, yeah, we got to understand in, right like there's a yeah, lamb sitting I, on the throne in heaven i don't think there's yes. a lamb sitting up there going bah! like it's talking about yeah. something else right and when i say we're saved by the cross well am i saved by this wood no i'm not saved by the wood the mm-hmm. cross represents more than just the cross right or mm-hmm. if i say i'm saved by jesus's resurrection well i'm saved by his death which shed his blood that saves from sin his burial and his resurrection. So sometimes biblical writers life. will use right. yes, his life. The biblical writers will use one thing to represent a bigger picture. And so, you know, when I look at first Timothy 1 16, I would say, okay, from this verse alone, if you believe, are you automatically saved? Right? I'd say if this is the only verse I had, I'd say maybe so. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what it says. But since Paul said his conversion was a pattern, I say let's go look at his conversion and see what happened in his conversion. And what was said, and at least that gives us, hey, this is what Paul says. This is how he was converted. And I think the reason it's good to look at Paul's conversion is like I started to say a minute ago, in John 3, you can argue about what John 3, 3 through 5 means, right? And I'm sure we'll discuss it. You know, It's not does talking it, about it, baptism. Well, yeah, like is it is it referencing like what we talked about before that you believe Ezekiel 36, 25? It, or what I would believe and, like, and what I would argue all of the early church fathers taught that it was referencing water baptism mm-hmm. or Acts 238, which I hope we get to discuss in this time if we get so there. But let me just stop you real quick. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say this. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got to hold you to your standard. You you hold me to my standard. Yeah, I'll hold I agree. You to your standard. Okay. I'm good so yeah. the standard of the church of Christ is we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where it's silent. Right? Correct. Synecdoche Correct. is nowhere in there. Right? So Synecdoche you, is nowhere in the Bible. But that, that word's nowhere in the Bible, right? And so I understand what you're saying, but I just yeah. want to make it a little bit more hard Do you disagree you, with right? me? Right? No. You no, disagree. I, I'm, I'm with you. No, I'm with you. But, I agree that Bible writers use that. that right, right, figure. right. But what I'm saying right. is it's like me talking to an atheist, okay? When okay. I'm speaking to an atheist, I'm a presuppositional apologist, okay? So I'm going to use the okay. presuppositional apologetics. I'm going to use the Word of God to show him he's wrong, right? But here's what the atheist does. He wants to take things from God's word, from God's law, to make his world somewhat consistent where he can live in it. But I won't allow him because he doesn't believe this book. So I can't allow you to take things from this book just to make your system work, right? So what I'm saying, like, for you, I'm like, well, you know, you've talked about synecdoche, but that's, I mean, the explanation that's not in the Bible. Here's the other thing. You talked about with well, early church fathers. Mm-hmm. You're one of the only Church of Christ people who would ever go back to the church fathers, right? Because they're like, no, no, no. We left the creeds. We left what they said. That's just their interpretation. That's not what they're – we yeah. only speak no, what no, the Bible no. speaks, right? Yeah. I would agree with you. Yeah. By me referencing the early church fathers, no, I'm, I'm not I'm saying native. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just pointing but it no. out for all the Church of Christ people who are listening. Sure. Like you're breaking their rules. I'm just calling that well, out. I don't mind if you do it. I think it's good. I think that you need that, right? 
what I would say is absolutely, you know, if any man speak, let him speak as oracles of God, First Peter 4, 11, right? I, I don't think the early church fathers are inspired at all. All I'm saying is it's really cool to be able to look back at what we would call, what are truthfully the first commentators. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you read commentary and you say like, oh, that's interesting. Okay. And you reject it if you think it rejects the Bible. I just think it's interesting when you look back to the very first commentators who ate, spoke, slept Greek that they did think, and this is a side note with John 3, that that's what it was referring to. But let me, my bigger point that I keep, I guess I'm muddling the waters is, you know, we could look at John 3, 3 through 5 and argue about definition and meaning. Uh, we could look at Acts 2, 38, which I hope we can, and discuss what this Greek word means, right? right. Um, we could look, I think the reason I like to look at Paul's account is it tells the whole story, right? Like you've got an account instead of just like Acts 8, 11, and 12, Philip preaches in Samaria, men and women here, they believe and are baptized. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, you look at Saul's account, Saul and Paul, he's called both before and after, doesn't matter. Right. Um, look at that account, you see pretty much the whole story. So I'd love for us to just start mm -hmm. by going to, you know, Acts. And if I can, let me maybe make, can I make my case to you and then you sure. rebut it? or how Come on with it? it, buddy. Come on with it. Because this is the one that, right. that this this hamstrung you back into the church of Christ. When you left the church of Christ, you weren't out of the church of Christ. But Paul's conversion, man, that's what got you back in the church of Christ, right? Okay. One, one of them. I think it's a strong okay. one. Okay. So um, here's, I guess, my uh, take on this. You've got Acts get, chapter— gonna go? I'm going to get it, I'm gonna get lined up here so people can see it. I like yeah. people to read the Bible with me and not just tell them what it says. I want them to see it for themselves. So right. Acts what? We're going to go to Acts 9 first? Uh, yeah. Let's go to Acts 9 first, right? Okay. Um, in Acts 9, pull it up on mine so I can just read on mine. Um, so in Acts chapter 9, ESV is what you've got there. Mm -hmm. I can get whatever okay. you want. Do you want something else? I've got New King James and ASB and ESV. ESV is fine. Um, so you've got in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, um, you just want to read it? or Go ahead. Okay. All right. So I'll read it. Uh, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's getting his arrest warrants, right? Damascus, mm -hmm. 130 miles I think, northeast. Verse 3, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. So he calls him Lord there, but hey, he doesn't even know who he is. He's just, hey, you got lots of power. Yeah. Who are you? And then he says, I'm Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. So then in verse 6, um, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Verse 6, rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do, okay? Mm -hmm. So Jesus says, go to the city. You're going to be told what you must do, you are to do. The men who are traveling with – now, I'll say this. If someone uh, – like I use a New King James, um, but I've got a lot of textual variant stuff of my own. If, if you know what I'm talking about, you know why I mentioned that. Um, but – um, if someone is reading along and you have a new King James or a King James, that's a textual variant issue, which I mean, I, we can always talk about later. Um, so verse seven, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. All right. So let me ask you this, Trey, and this is, I don't know, you know this, but why did, why do you think he didn't eat or drink? Why didn't he eat or drink? Because I think there's yeah, three I mean, think days there. It's almost like he's reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There's three days. So you don't think that for three days he's got, he doesn't have sight? You don't think that he didn't eat or drink because he was maybe penitent or felt awful for the fact that he was persecuting Christians? Normally in the Bible, fast, yeah. Yep. A lot of times fasting is connected with, you know, like penitence or, mm -hmm. look, I just found out from Jesus I've been persecuting him. I'm sick to my stomach. Sick to my stomach. Right. Yeah. I'm good So he that. doesn't. All right. Uh, verse 10. Now there's, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am Lord. Verse 11. And the Lord said to him, rise, go to the street called straight at a house, at the house of Judas for a man of Saul, a man of Tarsus named Saul for behold, he is praying. Okay. And he has seen in a vision, a man named Ananias come in mm -hmm. and lay his hands on him so he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said, go, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. 
So Ananias departed and entered the house. All right. So I normally will like draw this out on a piece of paper, right? So like I'm not obviously going to do that, but a piece of paper where I can't uh, see it. There it is. I know. So I'll draw a line and basically put, okay, all the things that the apostle Paul did before he meets Ananias, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is in verse 17, this is where Ananias finally meets Paul. Okay. Okay. And so Ananias departed, entered the house, verse 17, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may two things, regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that are going to happen. It doesn't tell us how it happens. Okay. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. All right. So this is like the first time you see this account. Um, it's always interesting to me in this account, if if you scroll back up to verse six, um, where Jesus told uh, Ananias or Paul, you're going to be told what you are to do. Mm -hmm. Um account doesn't actually give you those instructions, right? So Jesus says, hey, go to the city. Someone's going to tell you what you are to do, right? Or what you must do, different translations, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this account doesn't actually tell you what he was told. It tells you what he did, which you can sort of I imply. Think I, would, I would argue that it does. Okay. What would you What would you say in this account? Would you say it gives the full picture? You know where I'm going with this. Oh, I know where. Yeah. I mean, like you hear, you know, I'm, I'm going to use one of your lines that you said when you were breaking down my boy, Todd Wagner. Yeah. You said the lie you hear a thousand times is better, is easier to believe than the truth you hear once. Right? Yeah. That was you. Yeah. And I would say yeah. that is, is the case here. Like you, you've been told this and you've taught this and you've believed this your whole life. But, and that, that what, so what is he told to, that he's to do? Right. It doesn't yeah. say anything here. Now we have That's to go right. to Acts 22. We have to go up here and then we'll be told, no, 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 it's, it's here. And this is going to match everything else and all the other accounts, even his own account in Galatians 1. So you'll be told what you are to do. Well, okay. so he, the Lord said to him, rise, go street call straight. We're going to talk about this even deeper here in a minute, but I'm going to let you get your point across first. But I just want to tell you, this is what he is to do. And he tells Ananias what he's going to do, right? Okay. Okay. He's a chosen instrument of mine. To what? Okay. To carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings of the children of Israel. For I will show him sure. how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. That's what he is to do, to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. That is what yeah. he is to do. That's what he is set apart to do. And we're going to look at all of these accounts, and I'm going to show you, like, instead of jumping here and jumping there to make your point that it's baptism, that's not that's not it at all. His What he's being chosen to do and what he is to do is to be an instrument um, of God through preaching the gospel to the Gentile nations. So it's right yeah. here. So you're now wanting to yeah. go to Acts 22, well, but, correct? Yeah, but to, to kind of hold you on there too, in verse 6, you're going to be told what you are to do, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're, I know that you agree that Acts 22 gives more information of things oh, he was to yeah, do. Yeah, it gives you, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. right. I, mean so, I would say Acts 26 gives you more. So I agree. No, I, I don't say disagree. Galatians, I would say Galatians 1 gives you the same, and they're all saying the same thing, sure. but you, I think that, um, well, because I think of you baptism would... and your belief in baptism so much, it, it skews you from actually seeing what, what he is to do. And you just see this baptism thing here, but that's okay. No, I, I would say, yeah, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be, uh, apostle to the Gentiles, right? He's going to bring, you know, turn them from darkness to light, Acts 26, what, 20, you know, so, all those, all those things. Yeah. So he did, he, he did what he is to do, right? I'm saying what yeah. he is to do. Is not yeah. baptism. What he is to do is be the forerunner, like you started off in First Timothy, one fourteen, right? Yeah. Be the forerunner. Yeah. He's the foremost center of all. And if he can save me, he can save for. And it's, it's for all who believe for eternal life. And that's why he was chosen to do that. And this is all making. This is all saying the same thing from First Timothy to Acts nine to Acts twenty two to Acts twenty six and to Galatians one, which we'll all look at all of these things. So let's, let, can we go to Acts 22? Yes, sir. Okay. So go. Acts 22, you've got Paul uh, retelling his conversion account. Mm -hmm. And so in Acts chapter 22, uh, you've got, uh, I guess, verse, pick up in verse 10, right? So this is where you can see their parallel accounts if you want to read the whole chapter. But Acts 22, 10. And I said, what uh -oh. shall I do, Lord? You got it? Wait a Lose it? It's slowing on me a little bit. 
It's coming. All right. Acts Rise, 22. go to Damascus. There you'll be told all that right. is appointed for you to do. That's right. So what shall I do, Lord? He calls him Lord, and then he finds out, you know, it's it's Jesus, okay? Um, and then in verse 11, since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who are with me and came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by the Jews who live there, came to me and standing by me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, to hear a voice from his mouth. That's Jesus, the righteous one, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, for you will be a witness for him, for Jesus, to everyone of what you have seen and heard. Now, here's the question, and this is where I guess maybe the rubber meets the road. We already know where I was headed with this, but for anybody watching maybe that needed mm -hmm. the background. So my question to you is, you know that Paul believed already, right? Would you agree that Paul had already believed yeah, there's no in doubt. Jesus? When no doubt. Yeah. I would say he's already penitent or felt sorry for what he did. I would say that there's evidence that when he fasted and prayed for three days that he was likely mm -hmm. praying for forgiveness. I mean, it's, I would say that's not in the text, but I'm inserting it. What What would you do if you've been killing Christians and Jesus appears to you and says, stop it, you're persecuting my church? The first thing you'd pray for would be, you know, not a Ferrari. You'd pray for forgiveness, right? All right. So he's met Jesus. Um, he's been praying three days. He's penitent. He's been fasting. Um Acts 9 says he's already been miraculously healed. And so my question to you is, why in verse 16 does Ananias say, why do you wait? Rise. Paul's likely, I don't know if he's still praying or if he's laying down or what. He's blind. He's not walking around probably. Why do you wait, rise, and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name? So I guess my question would be, and I, I know from our previous discussions, um, in the previous discussions when I brought this up, I asked, you know, hey, Trey, why was Paul, who, according to what you would say, and what you said in our previous conversations, you said Paul was already saved. And mm -hmm. so my question, why would Ananias tell Paul that he needed to be baptized to wash away his sins? Now, mm -hmm. even if you want to argue that the baptism wasn't what did it, my question to you is, why was Ananias telling Paul that he was still in his sins? Because you would say that Paul's forgiven of his sins already. You'd say as soon as he believed, well, as soon as God miraculously changed his heart, then he was forgiven of his sins, right? And so why would Ananias tell him that he needed to be forgiven of his sins? You know, yeah. like I, I have a hard time. Was Ananias, was Ananias wrong? You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. So well, how would you, yeah, how would you tackle that? Yeah, I'm going to tackle it for you. But I want to point out a yeah. few things before I answer that. Um, Perfect. Because like your last question was Ananias wrong. So my question okay. to you is, if that's your understanding, and if that is your understanding, then let me ask you something. Is God wrong? Is, is God wrong? No. No. Wrong. no. Mm -mm. And the Bible does not contradict, does it? I agree. Never contradict, contradicts. I agree. Okay. So first, let's just talk about what he's appointed to do. You're trying to make the case that he's appointed to be baptized to receive the forgiveness of sins. Is that your point? Is that fair? My point in, in the question I'm asking directly is verse 16. Why does Ananias tell him he still is in his sins and needs them washed away if he was saved already? Yeah, I'm going to address that first. But I think your first point, and this okay. is what you were making your point on when you're breaking down Todd Wagner. Uh, you said in Acts 9, Jesus tells him he's going to tell him what he's got to do. Right. And then you jump to Acts 22 to say, see, he had to be baptized. So I think that your point you're trying to make that he what he's appointed to do is be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Is that fair to say? One. Yeah. One of the many things Paul was appointed to do. OK. Just like, you know, one of the many things that any person, I mean, as a Christian, right. somebody is appointed to, you know, live their life for Christ. Right. So with Paul specifically, yes, he was appointed to do things. Acts 9, Acts 26, Galatians mm -hmm. 1. Got Timothy to. one. So let's 16. just look yeah. at this real quick. Let me address that first. What's he appointed to do? Okay. Well, we went through it in chapter nine. What he, you know, he's going to tell him what he's what he has to do. What is it? Okay. Well, he's going to be set apart as an apostle for the Gentiles to spread the gospel, and he's going to suffer. Right. Okay. That's what he's to do. Here, he says, "Rise, go in Damascus, and you will be told all that is appointed for you to do." Okay. okay, so he goes to Damascus, all right? Okay. And here's what Ananias says to him. 
because we know Jesus also talked to Ananias and told him. And so he says, Brother Saul, I think that's interesting. We can talk about that in a minute too. Yeah. Because you don't, you don't consider unbaptized believers your brother, you know? And this word significantly by Luke means like a brother in Christ, not kinsman. They're two different Greek words. In the next chapter, he uses it for kinsman. It's a different word in Greek. So brother Saul, what, what, receive your son. What Greek? Yeah, let's, can we talk about that? That brother, the idea of brother concept right there. So quick, let me just, I want to make one point right here of the appointment of what I'm he's right, appointed I'm to do. Brother, because I wrote it down on my okay. notes. We'll come back to that. So brother Saul, receive your sight. Okay. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, yep. the God of our father, the God of our fathers appointed you. So remember earlier, Jesus says, listen, you're going to be told what you're appointed to do. Right. Back in Acts 9, he says, well, what you are going to do is be uh, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. That's what you're going to do. Here in sure. 22, he says, look, you're going to be told what you're appointed to do. And here Ananias, sure. speaking on behalf of God, says, well, here's what you're appointed to do, to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of uh, what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Right? So this is sure. verse 15 is what he's appointed to do. So now what are you waiting for? Right? Rise and be baptized okay. and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Another thing I would point out is when we read all these accounts, I also want to read Acts 26 and Galatians 1 um, of this account. Um, Ananias was not sent by Jesus to get baptizing. Before we get to uh, Acts 26 and mm -hmm. Galatians 1, can we tackle two things in Acts 22? Number one, the first one was brother in yeah. uh, Acts 22, 13. Because you and and then Acts twenty two sixteen the idea of his sins you mentioned in Acts twenty two thirteen that there are two Greek words for brother do you know what what Greek words are you referring to Adelphoi is the one that is used I mean mm -hmm. you know it seemed like you were saying that the word brother in in verse thirteen uh, mm -hmm. no I do not believe that he's using it in the sense of a saved Christian brother and the reason is because that word brother Adelphoi is used throughout the New Testament. Um, in many ways, it's used of the brothers of Jesus, those his physical brothers. Uh, it's used of um, uh, in Acts two thirty seven. You've got the people says, "Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved?" They're asking, "What shall we do?" Um, mm -hmm. I added "save" just for clarity's sake, but they're asking, "What do we need to do?" Right. right. So that word Adelphoi, I would disagree. Um, in Acts twenty two thirteen, that's the word. It's Adelphos. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't, and, and, uh, Romans, when we talked about this before, I brought up Romans nine where Paul uses Adelphoi and he says, basically, I tell you the truth in Christ Romans. I'm not lying. Mm -hmm. My conscience bearing witness in the Holy spirit that I have uh, great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself cursed from Christ for my brethren, which is Adelphos, my countrymen, according to the flesh. So mm -hmm. Paul, who is the writer of Romans, inspired by spirit uses that term for his Jewish brethren who were lost. Cause right. in chapter 10, he talked about 10, how he wishes they would be saved. Right? right now, if you were to bring up the objection of, well, that's different writer. Number one, I'd say acts 22, 13, um, is Paul retelling his own conversion account. But if you wanted to discount that, you could still go Luke, same writer of acts. Um, in acts two, he used brethren, Adelphoi, the Greek word to describe Jewish brethren, um, and in Luke eight nineteen, he used that same term Adelphoi's of Jesus's physical brothers who didn't believe in him. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would lovingly press you on the idea yeah. that there's a difference between Adelphoi and what's the other Greek word that you're referencing? Twenty three verse six. It's the next twenty three. Let me just go here. So yeah, I would I would argue the. Um, Men and brethren, yeah, that's Adelphos, mm -hmm. you know. But I would, I would say he's he's addressing there the Sadducees and Pharisees. So I would say that's not his Christian brethren. Exactly. Um, so that's now the point. Well, no, that's my point because you said Adelphos, the word used in Acts twenty two thirteen. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that that shows that he was saved, and it means it, that's the word used for a Christian brother. But By Luke, in Acts twenty, Luke, Luke is using it that way, right? No, I would say here, Luke's not using it. Adelphoi is countryman or brother. 
countrymen. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So when he's talking to That's the Pharisees, fitting. he's re- referring to them That's as countrymen, like his kinsmen, as far as like the blood of genetic physical. code, right. right? Yes. So yes. we go over here, and when he speaks of, man, I, I guess I got too much stuff running on this computer. Um, back to twenty-two. 13. Yeah, 2213 is Adelphos, which is the Greek word for brother. I don't know of another Greek word for brother. Um, I mean, all the lexicons I have, I've never seen another one, you know. There, yeah, I mean, the other word you may be thinking of, the word anair, mm-hmm. which, but that, that Greek word means man or husband. So let's see here. You know, the, the idea that in, in Acts 2213, uh, the idea that Paul is calling him a brother because he's, you know, already saved. And the argument, well, he used the word Adelphos, which means Christian brother. That I just say that's not right because that word's used many I'm places I'm so physical. So, so that's why in Acts 22, 13, he's his brother Saul. He used it the same way Paul used it in Romans 9, 1 through 3, calling lost Jews brethren. He used it the same way. Luke, same writer in Acts 2 and verse 37. And Luke so, yeah. 8, 19, his physical brethren. Um, Believer brother. Regardless, we can get into yeah. a word study okay, of so, that deeper. Let's just let's just keep going with Acts twenty two. I'm saying okay, so, calling brother as a believer, like it says right here in the Greek. Yeah. Um, so so sixteen. My fundamental question, the basic is, if Paul's already saved, why is Ananias telling him he's still in his sins? I know the first time that we discussed, um, and you know, I, and I've changed positions multiple times. You're free to do that. I'm not trying to like cause problems, but. I know when we discussed before, um, I had asked that you had said something like that you thought, well, Ananias didn't know what Paul had had and hadn't done. Um, I think you said, I mean, I have, I took notes, like not and record the call, but I took notes. Right. Um, I want to misrepresent you. And so even on that call, I remember saying, hey, man, look, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I definitely don't want to misrepresent you. But um, is this what you said? And I think you said that Ananias was not aware that Paul um, what he had already done. Like Ananias didn't know that Paul was saved already. And so when Ananias says, you need to wash away your sins, mm-hmm. Ananias was actually mistaken and Paul was already saved. Like, is that your understanding? Like, tell me why you well, think he says he's well, saved. Well, yeah, I think he's saved already, right? Okay, you think Paul's um, saved already? Yeah, I think he's saved already. I think he's already considered righteous in the eyes of God already. Um, and we'll look at that. So is Ananias, is Ananias mistaken? Is he wrong? No, I think Ananias is called by God to go see this guy. And he's like, what in the world, man? This guy's killing people, right? And Jesus is like, look, okay. do you have any record that, that Jesus tells Ananias that, no, he's good, he's, he's, everything's good. Now he says that I'm going to make him go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel. And I'm going to use him for this purpose, right? He, Ananias knows that, correct? Sure. Okay. Yeah. But he doesn't really know anything that. else, right? I mean, uh, tell me, he what only, does the scripture say? He, he, only knows him what, he only knows what God told him in Acts 9. Which is uh, what? in Acts nine, but he's going to use him yeah. to be a vessel. Sure, sure. Right? But right now, yeah, I, I don't know. So he tells him so, this right here: get up, be baptized. Right, rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now, again, I would argue the calling on his name is how the point of our justification. When we call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Everyone who believes and confesses yeah. is saved. We'll be saved. Right. So I would say that the wash away your sins part is by calling on his name, rise and be baptized because okay. that's what we're called to do in the great commission, make disciples, baptize sure. them. Baptize who? Sure. Disciples. Who are disciples? Followers okay. of Jesus Christ. The disciples were okay. first called Christians at Antioch, right? So who was called Christians? Disciples. Go make disciples, baptize them, meaning you're baptizing disciples. So Ananias is just doing what the great commission is said to do. He's baptizing I would argue in Matthew 28, mm-hmm. where it says, go and make disciples, that's the imperative command. And it's followed by two heiress participles, which mm-hmm. means basically, you know, uh, if I say go clean your room, that's the imperative command. And you clean it by picking up your clothes and uh, folding the laundry, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's what heiress, that's what heiress participles do. They tell you how to fulfill the imperative command. Mm-hmm. And this is a side note. And this, we probably, I don't want to leave Acts 22, 16 yet, but yeah. in Acts 20, 8, 18 through 20, go and make disciples, imperative command. 
two participles. How do you make a disciple? By baptizing and teaching. And I actually think there's some Greek resources that talk about the interchangeability. So it could be teaching and baptizing. That's a side yeah. note. And we can but, get to but, that because I think this is what disciples do, right? Disciples want to be like their leader. They want to follow their leader. They yeah. want to learn from their leader and look like their leader. Yeah. So go make disciples. So, so here, I, man, I'm sorry. I know I interrupt. I, I, if you watch, if you've seen the episode of the podcast, Scott and Tucker are like, we actually even made a button on the soundboard that they could press mm-hmm. when they wanted me to like quit talking. So I apologize for that. No, you're good. I'll go ahead. But why is Ananias telling Paul he needs to wash away his sins if he's already mm-hmm. saved? And I guess that's my question. Is Ananias mistaken? Maybe like, Ananias doesn't does An- know yet, right? I don't know your heart. Do you know my heart? Do you know my no, heart? No, I don't know. I don't, no, no. I don't know your heart. I think you're genuine. I like you. We, well, yeah. I like talking to you. Yeah. And so yeah. I would say, you know, to back that up, when I say, man, I don't know your heart, Aaron. You don't know my heart. Only yeah. God knows my heart, and I know I know my heart, and God knows my heart. That would be First Corinthians chapter two, right? Discusses sure. all that. Ananias sure. doesn't know the heart of Paul. Like he he doesn't know what's going. On. He's probably scared to death. He is scared to death. He's like, dude, this people, this guy's killing people. Yeah. Christians, like, what? Me, I I, I got to go to him. Like, I don't want to go to him. He's like, I'm going to use him. He's going to be used by me, right? That's what Ananias knows. What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We would argue in the historical Christian faith that it's okay. by faith and calling on the name of the Lord in faith and trust in Him in Jesus Christ that your sins are um, you're justified at that point and you are seen as spotless and sinless, just as if you've never sinned. Rise and be baptized is what we do. Is what Christians do. Is what disciples do. Disciples get baptized. So yeah, back to this. So now, again, Ananias doesn't know his heart. He's just doing what he's called to do in the Great Commission. Let's okay. just look and see what God knows. So what, just, what this, matters? So just to clarify, you're saying Ananias said he need to wash away his sins because Ananias did not know already that Saul was saved. I, I mean, I don't know what Ananias, I, all I know is what Ananias, well, I'm reading right here. Well, that's yeah, Ananias I mean, knows. that's because here's my look at it. I feel like, um, and, I'm, and I don't know if this is your position, but if, if you basically look at Acts 22, 16, I went to mm-hmm. Acts 9, come back. If you go to Acts 22, 16. And Ananias says, why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized, mm-hmm. okay? And wash away your sins, calling mm-hmm. on his right. um, There's only, I think there's two possibilities. Number one, Paul, which what I would think would be the right position, that Paul had already believed. He'd been praying for three days. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd been fasting. So obviously he felt bad. I think that shows repentance. Um, so he's believed, he's repented. And yet, why does Ananias tell him that he still has to have his sins washed away? I would say so look, because— since you're you're bringing up all the participles and stuff. Let me ask yeah. you a question here. Yeah. The command of wash away your sins is connected to what participle? Well, aorist imperative and uh, ar- arise and be baptized in aorist imperative. Wash away your sins is an aorist imperative. Calling on his name is an aorist participle. So what's it connected to? Uh, well, I think the, the aorist participle— away- the washing think, away your sins is connected to calling on his name, not yeah. the be baptized. Correct? Okay, well, let me, I mean, wait, 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 just, let's just be fair and honest, okay? You first brought of all, up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold I'm on. okay with that. I'm, okay, I'm okay, not. Wait, wait. Hold on. Okay. I okay. don't want to interrupt you much, but I mean, look, I just want to say something. I'm if you're going to bring up pres- participles and all this, da, 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 so I'm just holding you to your standard. You, you wanted yeah. to go there. So yeah. let's just be honest with whoever's listening to this. Okay. What is it? Just be completely honest. Okay. What is the phrase? Okay. What is the phrase? Wash away your sins. What is connected? What is that connected with? What part of that sentence? Now I know you want to say baptism, but if we were going to be honest, could you just say it? Like, yeah, the principle is actually connected to the calling on His name. Well, let me ask you this: Do you do you think Boy, from do, your do, not, do you not want to you don't want to answer? Just I'm, trying to. Okay, I'm, try, I'm trying to. Okay, I'm trying. Go ahead. Do you think that a participle can only be connected to one imperative verb, or can it be connected to two? No, I mean, I'm sure it okay. can be. But what is it here? Okay. Well, here, uh, so two things. Is it rise Number, to? Uh, uh, rise is not imperative. Um, it's an aorist participle, plus it's a different voice, I think. I think be baptized is middle voice, which means it's something he needs to do. Um, wash away your sins is aorist middle. Calling on his name is aorist middle. 
So I'm going to say that all three of them are happening at the same time. And here's why I'll say that. I think the argument that you've been making is that calling on his name is what? A prayer or trusting in him? No, I think it's a, a heart a heart thing. Like a but Paul, true Paul trust and faith in Jesus Christ, calling on his name. and, and um, says, I would say that if, if, if calling on his name is a prayer, Paul already did that. Uh, he did it in Acts 9. That's what God told Ananias. You got to earlier. You said, "Well, we don't know what Ananias knew. We knew. We know from Acts nine that he knew. God told Ananias, hey, this guy's praying.' Like, I think that shows genuine trust and faith, and the fact that God hears his prayer. I mean, so you've got in verse sixteen, call, wash away your sin. I'm fine, honestly, if you connect it with calling on his name, because mm-hmm. I would say calling on his name is not praying. It's not trusting because he's already done that. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, let's even stop, stop, stop. Wait, 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 stop. We're done. Yeah, okay. yeah. Look. Okay. You just said that, right? Because the parcel, Repeat. it is connected to the calling on his name. And I'm fine you with just that. said, right. <clears throat> and you just said he's already done that, right? Do you what? agree? Calling on his name. He's already called on the name of the Lord. No. You no, just said that. If, I can rewind that. And uh, if, if I said that, if I said that, um, then that's not. He's that, already called on his name. No, when I he don't. Said, Lord, I, what, Lord, what must I do? I know what you're thinking. So what I said is if calling on his name is a prayer or just trusting, then he would have already done that. That's not what I think. That's why I'm saying the position. If somebody says so, calling on his name is a prayer or trusting, then Paul should be saved already. Ann and I should not be talking to him go. about it. Thank you. Thank you. That's my point. He is already saved. Well, then why? Wait, then wait, is wait, Anna- stop. Let's, let's slow down. I want to ask you okay. again. Okay. If he has already called on his name, which I would say is like okay. Romans 10, 9 and 10, like Romans okay. 10 where it says, whoever calls the name of the Lord be saved. It is trusting. It is faith and trust, true, genuine trust in Jesus Christ for who he is and what he's done. <clears throat> if he has called on his name, and, and that's what that means, which it's connected to the wash away your sins, then he's already saved is what you said, right? Is that fair? I said, if you were right, yes. But I'm going to argue that's not what calling on his name means because you said he already did it. If he already did that, then why is Ananias still telling him he has sins to wash away? Like if, if calling on his name Wait, was true. Again, again, do you know my heart? No. No. And I don't know your heart. I'm, I'm, I'm just called to do what I'm called to do, right? Go make disciples what, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sure. So what is Acts 9? Go back to Acts 9 and go look at Acts 9, 11. Because I, I agree. We can't know Ananias' heart or what God told him unless we have it in Scripture, right? So in Acts 9... In verse 11, the Lord said to him, Ananias, verse 10, the Lord said to Ananias, go to that rise, go to the street called Straight mm-hmm. at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named mm-hmm. Saul, for behold, he is what? Praying. Praying. Does, mm-hmm. Do you think that, that is a, not a genuine prayer? I mean, do you think that that's not, I, I'm, I'm not, I, mean, no, I guess dude, I'll say I love it. I'm, I'm just letting I'm not, you talk and I'm just letting you, yeah. I'm letting you go. I'm letting you go. I'm going to answer you all of this. I promise you. Okay. And okay. So what you said is true. Know. If, if he had called on his name and if trusting in God, if that is it, then his sins would be forgiven at this point. I, I agree with you. Okay. So my, that's okay. So we're on the same page. So my question to you would mm-hmm. be, since you think he's already saved, since you think he's already called on his name, then why does Ananias tell him he needs to wash away his sins? Because you think, so I guess my ultimate thing is, and, and this is kind of what you stated in our previous Zoom conversation, is that you'd stated Ananias basically was wrong. Like, no, 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 even no, no, if it's no, a mistake. No, no. Even hear if it hear a me mistake. out clear. Hear me again. Look. Okay. I'm just using scripture. I'm not using dead men's names. I'm not using church fathers. I'm just using your standard. Speak with the Bible. Speak silent words silent, right? Here's I would what I say about that's- Ananias. Acts twenty two sixteen. Yeah, yeah. Here's what I would say about Ananias. Okay. He only knows what he knows. Jesus said, look, dude, I'm about to send this guy. He's a killer. And I'm going to use him. And Ananias like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. And he's praying. He's praying. So he died to tell him that. Hold on. And so he's like, no, he, he's praying to me. We got it. You know, you're gonna, he's going to get his sight back. He knows that you're coming. I told him that you're coming. He Look, he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in, lay his hands on him. So that he might regain his sight. So Jesus has answered his prayers, right? Okay. This Saul guy's praying. Jesus is answering his prayers. 
Ananias, all he knows is that dude's a murderer. He kills the people of the way. He wants to destroy the church. And you're calling me to do something with this guy? He said, just tell him what I'm telling you. He's going to be used and he's appointed, not to be baptized. He's appointed, you know why he's appointed for? To be a light to the Gentiles, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to carry the message to the Gentiles. And your job, Ananias, is to, so he can regain his sight. That's, that's why you're, that's why I'm using you. But then guess what Ananias does? He does what the Great Commission is told to do. Go make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so okay. he does that. And he says, look, wash away your sins, call, rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Those are, those are what's connected there in the Greek. And so, which makes sense with all the other scriptures in scripture that says that believe in the Lord, you'll be saved. Whoever, whoever calls the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's not just simply screaming, Lord. It's true, genuine, heartfelt understanding and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So let me now answer your question. Are you ready? Okay. Because the first time you called me, you said this is the one that brought you back into the church of Christ. Right? You couldn't get past this one. You just stated a while ago that if, Trey, what you're saying is true, okay, then his sins would already be forgiven. If, he, if, if calling on the name of the Lord is truly trusting in Jesus Christ— uh, and true faith, like genuine faith, then his sins would already be forgiven if you're right, Trey. And I'm like, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so let's talk about something else here. Again, Ananias is just a dude that God's using. And what's, So he's not what inspired? We, Ananias isn't inspired? I, I think Ananias yeah, I, is a guy that Jesus called and said, listen, I'm going to send this dude to you. You're going to give him a sight back and tell him I'm going to use him, and he is going to suffer for it, okay? okay? And that's what he told him. And then he did what Christians are to do, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's what happened. Now, and I want to, I want to speak for a little bit. You've been talking a lot, so I want to kind of walk you through this. Sure. Sure. So sure. what is he appointed to do? Your point is, and the Church of Christ's point is, well, he's appointed to be baptized. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Now, we saw in chapter 9, it was to preach the gospel of the Gentiles. We see in chapter 22, it's to preach the gospel of the Gentiles. We see in chapter 26, to preach the gospel of the Gentiles. We see in Galatians 1, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And here's what's very crazy. If I asked you, Aaron, or if you were to ask me when I was in the church of Christ, now look, I preached in the church of Christ. I taught in the church of Christ. I was all in, 100% all in. And people can tell you. That's why they're mad at me, because I was all in. And dude, Travis Thomas would would convert to Reformed theology before I would back then. Okay. You know, okay. that's how staunch I was. So here's the deal. If you would ask me back then, if I ask you right now, hey, when were you converted, Aaron? Just tell me sure. real quick, quick in a nutshell, tell me when you were converted and how. I Just would say when God— 30, 30 seconds. Yeah, when God applied the blood of Christ to my— When that happened. Me, uh, at the point I was baptized. Mm. In, in faith, yeah. And I would point to, I mean, so, many passages. That's my but, point. Yeah. No, you okay. made my point. It's a perfect, perfect point. Sure. Um, I would have said the same thing when I was baptized. Something, that would have been in there somewhere, right? Sure. So Luke's recording chapter 9, and Luke's recording chapter 22. Sure. But when he's recording Paul talk about his conversion in chapter 26, you know what Paul never mentions? It's baptism. He doesn't mention anything sure. about his baptism. You he doesn't know, have to. Too. Wait a second. No, that's not Paul. This is just, uh, this is a historical account, right? Acts is a historical book, correct? The genre? Well, yeah, I mean, it's telling you what happened. Yeah, yeah I mean, I yeah. know what to do with that. No doubt. Telling you what happened. The outgrowth of the church from Jerusalem. So Luke wrote his gospel about the coming of the Messiah into Jerusalem. And then Acts, written to Theophilus, the same recipient. It's the outgrowth of the church outside of Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Sure. But what's ironic is when Paul talks about his conversion, he doesn't mention being baptized. Not in Acts 26 when Luke's recording him talk about it. Not recording the history of the events that took place and everything. No, when he's recording Paul talk about his own conversion, he doesn't mention baptism. When Paul is Paul's, telling the Galatians. Paul is talking in Acts 22, though. That's Paul giving his. That's Paul telling his conversion story in Acts 22. So in Acts 26, so Acts 26, it is Paul. He, 
Paul in Acts does 20. not mention his uh, conversion of baptism. Paul does not mention baptism in chapter 26. Yeah, I agree. But or Galatians just, 1. But you said in Acts 26, you said that in Acts 9 and Acts 22, it's Luke telling the story. And it's different in 26, but it's not. 26 and 22 mm-hmm. are both Paul. Acts 22, 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my yeah. defense for you. Okay. So Paul, Paul is telling his own right. conversion in Acts okay. 22. So here we go. Let's go back to 9. Okay. okay. Stand corrected on that. That one, he's telling it, and he, he talks about Ananias. Sure. Stand corrected. But the point is this right here. Ananias only knows what he knows. Okay? Okay. Let's not add to or take away from Scripture. Let's not read into things that's not there. Let's just take the Word of God for what it is. The Bible does not contradict, does it? No. No. And so here's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk for a little bit here because I want this to be very clear to you. Okay? okay. And I want people yeah. listening to this to understand this. Okay. Which you said it perfectly. Trey, if you're right, the calling on the name, which it is grammatically connected to washing away your sins, if that's true, then Trey, his sins were already forgiven. And I'm like, there you go. You got it, Aaron. You got it. I, but, I, doesn't I, know that. but I don't think you're right. I, I said know, that's I your... You that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But I'm going to show you, you're going to have to deny God's word if you don't see it now. So a lot of times when I'm, I'm explaining things to people and they have these ideas which are typically whatever they grew up with their whole life uh, and not historical Christianity. I'll tell them, look, that's fine. I understand you really believe that with all your heart. That's fine. But we're about to walk somewhere. And once we walk down this road, you can't go back the way you came. I mean, you can deny God's word, but that's going to be really hard. And you're going to toss and turn at night. Like I did when I saw this, I was like, crap, what do I do with this? I got to do something. I can't just, oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden it just all, everything just, it's there. But Acts 9, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? Let's just look at it together. Uh, he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Okay? The men didn't see it, right? So we got all that. Now, verse 10, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Rise, go to the street called Straight, and to the house of Judas. Look for a man, Tarsus, named Saul. For behold, he is praying. It's pretty important right there. He is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Let me ask you okay. something. How did Paul receive a vision? Like, who do you think gave him that vision? God gave him a vision. God yeah. gave him the vision. That what? That a man named Ananias would come in and lay his hands on him so that he might yeah. regain his sight. That's, that, that's what God assigned Ananias to do. Can we agree to that? Like that's all we have in Scripture. Like you, you might want to say, well, he told no, he had to be baptized. No, no, that's, that's, that's your heritage and your tradition telling you that. This is what the Scripture says. He, here's what he was sent to do. This. In Acts 22, Jesus even tells him, tell him that I'm, he's going to be used to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. All right? Then we're going to look at what Jesus says in chapter 26. But here, this, Paul, look at this. Paul, the Lord shines a light on him. And as you were correct, he said, Lord, like what in the world's going on? Just out of mm-hmm. a mighty power did something to him. He don't know. So then he says, so there's no mistake in, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Mm-hmm. Lord, Lord, what shall I do? I'm yours, dog. I'm yours. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm doing it. He yeah. said, just go. I'll tell you later. Just go. Yeah. Right? So he goes. He has this prayer. He's praying. Now, here's where we're going to have problems with not a systematic theology, just a biblical theology, understanding Scripture. Right? Right here, I have some notes here I want you to look at. Okay. Okay. When he's praying, I want you to look up for me, John 9, 31. I know what it says. I, what does it say? Quote it. Uh, it basically says that God, uh, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of him, of God or something and does his will, he hears him. Okay. So let me ask you something. Yeah. This guy in John 9, 31 says, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper, of God and does his will, God listens to him. Let me ask you something. 
is that verse true or not? Well, yeah, it's true. Yeah. So God does I mean, not God, listen to sinners. I know where you're going with that. You don't, do you think, you obviously think God's omniscient. Hold on. Before we go down that road, we can talk about all that in a minute. But here's what I'm telling you. It, God yeah, is relevant. listening to Paul. It's, it's, it's relevant. Listen, it's relevant. And we're going to talk about, look, God does not listen to sinners, but to worshipers he listens to. Um, now, if Paul was still sinful at this point, Jesus would yeah, not be hearing his prayer. And guess what? Jesus would not be giving him answers to his prayers. Okay. So let's look up at a, a different one here. Because, you know, that's that's John 9, 31. Real quick, that's John yep. 9, 31. Let me, just, let me answer. And then we'll get into omnipotence and all those things, right? I mean, so, I know the point, the point The point you're making is if God heard him, then he must have been saved. No, but no, that's no, not hold right. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold on real quick. Let me just okay. finish this, and then you can, and then we can discuss Deal. this further down the road. Now, you and I both know it's hard not to interrupt, so look, I'll let you go. He says we know. We know that God yeah. does not listen to sinners. How sure. does this Jew know that? Well, because the Old Testament teaches that, right? The yeah, Lord the is far. The Lord is Proverbs far from the wicked. You got it. Yeah. But he hears Psalms. the prayer of the righteous. Yeah. Okay. First Peter twelve. Yeah, that's. I mean, you're not so, going to get argued. With it so he's hearing said. the prayers of a righteous man, Paul, and he's answering his prayers, right? Because no, Paul says that we, by that faith, out. by faith, no. we're justified by sins, and our sins are forgiven. By faith in Jesus Christ, by faith we receive the Holy Spirit. By faith we receive the forgiveness of sins. By faith in Jesus Christ, and here the Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayers of the righteous. Now, see, God knows our hearts. First Corinthians chapter two, we don't. Ananias doesn't know anybody's heart. I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. God knows the heart. And this man, Paul, said, "Lord, Lord, who, what do you want me to do? I'm all yours, buddy." He says, "Go there." Guess what? He went. Why did he go? Because he believed that Jesus Christ was the true Messiah, the Christ. Here in Psalm 66, here's how they know that God doesn't listen to sinners in that way. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Isaiah 59, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Proverbs 15, So that's, Let's so that's one more. Ask you that one. Isaiah 59, too, before you move on. I mean, that's written to Israel. So mm -hmm. are you saying that Israel was never saved? Because the point, the point now we're getting, point, we're getting, wait, 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 we're getting into a lot deeper stuff. Well, let me ask you this. I would say not Jared, all Israel I, is Israel. That's what Romans 9 well, says. So I, 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 I'm trying, it's hard because like, I let hear me just you, show making, you one more, just one more. The okay. sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. He does not hear the prayers of sinners, but to worshipers of God, he does listen to. So here's the thing. Acts 9 and Acts 22. Um, he calls on him, Lord, Lord, what do I do? Meaning, I, I believe that you are the one I've been persecuting. I didn't believe all that in the past. Now I see it face to face. Oh my goodness, what shall I do? I'll do whatever. And Jesus says, I'll tell you what you're going to do. Go down to Damascus and I'll tell you what you're appointed to do. What his appointment was, nowhere was his appointment to be baptized. His appointment was to be, was be to a disciple to the Gentiles. That's in Acts. I would say 9, you're adding because Acts, because Acts 22, 16, Ananias does tell him that he needs to rise and be baptized. I well, didn't say that. Well, of course he tells him that, but Ananias tells him that because this is what you do with disciples. You, you, Jesus, the great commission, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what he tells them. Okay. And he says here, to do it, and he says, calling, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, which is connected to, wash away your but sins you, is connected to calling on the name of the Lord. Here right, again, you say he's done that, right? You said he's already called on the name of the Lord, if your definition is right, which Ananias I Ananias doesn't know that. So Ananias was Does wrong. Ananias know that? You tell me in the he, scripture, not, not what your tradition wants to tell you, like that, not eisegete the text, not put in the dude, text I'm, what you want it to I'm say. I'm not talking about tradition or Campbell or anybody. Okay. I'm talking about have pointed to nothing but scripture except the one analogy to the early fathers in John 3. Okay, Aaron, so, so here's what I'm asking you. Point okay. to me, okay? Don't isolate okay. the text. Don't put into the text what you want it to say. Okay. Tell me what it's saying. What is God saying? Where does Ananias know that he's done that? Now, God has told him that he's going to be a voice to the, you'll be a voice from his mouth. 
Uh, you'll be a witness. He's going to be a witness for him to everyone of what he has seen and heard. Like that's what he was told to tell him. That's what Jesus told him to tell him. So let me ask you this. What more? If, and if then I, gonna, can... I want to also look in chapter 26 to see what Jesus told him to do. That's right. So if I can, um, so you've connected a lot of things in the last probably 10 minutes that I would like to try to unravel. The first thing is um, you just made the argument that um, basically God does not hear sinners prayers, which is what John 9 31 uh, says. I would say this. Uh, I think that if you take the totality of the Bible and I can give you examples, the Greek word for here is a kuo. And if you have your software, if you got BDAG, you can look it. There's something called semantic range, which you know, but people watching may not, which means word, the same word has different meanings based off context. Exactly. hundred percent. Right? So the That's point that you were in a minute when we get to baptism, like deeper into okay. baptism. Okay. So the point that you are making is you said that since Ananias is told by God that Paul's praying, that means Paul's already saved, right? The only logical conclusion then with your, with your point is that Ananias was wrong whenever he tells Paul he needs his sins forgiven. Well, no. So, but I mean, he is wrong. It might, it might not be like the most gentle word, but if you're saying that Ananias tells Paul he needs to have his sins forgiven, but Paul actually, his sins were already forgiven, then even if Ananias had good intentions, what Ananias is accurate, right? No, I would say that, what, what are we called to do? He doesn't know. that He doesn't know. He just knows that he's been yeah. called by God, right? Like, it would be okay, like so, me. It would be like this he right doesn't. here, Aaron. Aaron, I don't know people's hearts. I don't know. So say somebody comes to me, right? And they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. They have truly trusted in Christ. Hey, how about this, Aaron? Say a guy comes from Kentucky and you run into him in the store. He's quiet. And you're talking to him. You share the gospel with him. And you tell him the gospel, you know, and the whole whatever, you know, repent, be, hear, believe, confess, be baptized. And you use Romans 6 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9 and all that stuff. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And you go through that, that deal. And you tell him, you know, look, you, you need to be baptized into Christ, you know, for the forgiveness of your sins and get the Holy Spirit. He's like, I've done that. Well, were you wrong for telling him that? He's already done it. I wouldn't, claim to be, I wouldn't claim to be inspired. So there's only two positions either. And I guess I'm just either Ananias is inspired or he isn't. Why is so Ananias you, inspired? Why wouldn't he be? God sent him to speak in the first century. They didn't have a New Testament. And so what spoke, did they do? And he told him what he was supposed to tell him, right? So, like, so I guess every, every person in the Bible that we re read, they're inspired. I think that God's sovereignty and providence does things. But So I, I love you, but I think you're running from this question. Uh, not and, at all. Not at all. Okay, so, so here's the question for probably the last 30 minutes I've been trying to get at. Ananias tells Paul that you still are in your sins. So either Paul was still in his sins or he wasn't. And that's my question. In Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, when Ananias says, mm -hmm. arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Ignore the baptism part for just one minute. Just when he says, wash away your sins. Mm -hmm. Was he already forgiven of his by sins? Calling or not? on his name. Yes. He was forgiven by God right. through his faith and his calling okay. on his name already. And Ananias didn't know that had happened. Let me let me let me show you what you're saying, how it's gonna get you in a pickle. Can I? Can I, I would love I would love for you to put me in a pickle after I deal with okay. the things that you brought up earlier. Okay. So the the point that you made, I think, is I just don't think it, it makes sense. So you're saying in Acts twenty two sixteen. So God does listen yeah. to sinners and answer their prayers. Uh, okay, let me give you this. You know that the word akuo here in Greek has different meanings. It has the meaning of actually hear, like I didn't hear you, and it has the meaning of heed or listen to. You can look up BDAG. Um, it's right here. So if you do a word study on akuo, all right, pull up BDAG. What are the, okay, BDAG, hear, grant a hearing, learn about, listen to, heed. Okay, so if the arguing is that when that God is omniscient and hears everything that's going on in the universe, except for that person who's praying that's a sinner, I would deny that. Um, you can look at places like Jeremiah 1 7 or Jeremiah 7 16, not 1 7. God told Jeremiah, if you, he's talking about Israel, how evil they were, he said, don't lift up and pray because I won't hear you. Well, does that mean that God literally couldn't hear Jeremiah? Mm -hmm. No, it no, means he, I, he doesn't I he, mean. he doesn't heed their call. Bingo. Bingo. And that is what John 9 is talking about. 
It's what Proverbs fifteen twenty nine is talking about. Of course if you it look is. At, of course it is. But wait a second. But wait a second. I, I'm, yes. But he is but heeding argu- his prayer, right? Is he no. heeding his prayer? Your He's argument answering in that his prayers. prayers. But He's your argument his, in that. Jesus is answering okay, I, his prayers. I can't make my point. So in Acts 9, 11, your argument was the fact that God knows that Paul is praying means he's saved. And your argument was that if he was lost, God couldn't hear his prayer. But that's not what John 9 mm-hmm. or Proverbs 16 or Psalm my 16 point, or 13 or 12. My you didn't point bring that is one the up. definition that he would not um, right here heed. Right, listen to like what you agreed to that that those that's what those verses are talking about. He's not going to heed them because why? Because they're sinful people. They don't worship him. They're not. Gonna, he's not going to heed their prayers. Uh, does he that's hear them? Of course. It's like in Amos three that he says, "Of all the nations of the earth, of all the families of the earth, I only knew you, Israel." Well, he knew that other people lived. When people come to Jesus and say, "Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name?" and he says, "Look, d- depart from me. I never knew you." No, he knew that they existed. He didn't know them in that type of relationship. Correct. Yes, and I okay. think that, that that there dismantles your 9-11 argument because your argument is since God heard that him pray, he's saved. Okay, let's let's hold on. Let's get away. Okay. The, let's look at this again. Okay. Okay. God does I've not listen to sinners. Okay, so he doesn't so, heed the sinners, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Acts. Okay. Can I make a request? Yeah. So Real quick. I would like to do two things if we could. I'm going to let you go, like let you talk. So the first one I'm still trying to understand is if you think Ananias is mistaken. Let's say, I won't say wrong. Maybe that sounds too harsh. Do you think that Ananias is mistaken? Even if he's just trying to preach the gospel, is Ananias mistaken when he tells Paul, you need to have your sins forgiven? No. Because you're saying his sins are already forgiven. So would you agree in your, from your position, Ananias is mistaken? Hold on. Let me, I'll answer that question. But first, remember what you just said, what John 9, 31 and all those texts I showed you, what is, it's not saying that he doesn't hear them. I agree with you. Of course he hears them. He hears everything. But what it's saying is he doesn't heed them. He doesn't heed them. He doesn't oblige. He's not obliged to answer them. Right. I agree. They're wicked. They're sinful people. He doesn't listen to sinners. Yeah. He doesn't listen to sinners. He doesn't heed sinners. Therefore, he's not going to answer sinners. Correct? Well, you, you have kids, right? This wait, is maybe wait, an analogy. Wait, wait, wait. Just stay with me here. Okay. Rise and go to the street called Straight. At the house okay. of Judas, look for a man, saw, uh, Tarsus, named Saul. For behold, okay. he's praying. So he hears him. And he has seen yep. a vision. I asked you earlier, where did that vision come from? God. God. So he's yeah. answering his prayer. So he is heeding God. the prayer of Paul. According to your own explanation, like that, that's my point. He doesn't heed sinners. He doesn't heed okay. and listen to wicked people, but worshipers of God, he does hear and listen to. Okay. Again, here he is. Rise and go to the street, call straight. He is praying and he has seen in a vision. I asked you earlier, where did he get that vision? You said, God, Jesus Christ. Sure. Sure. And he's going to come. So he's saying, look, I'm hearing your prayers, Saul, Paul, and I'm giving you an answer. Why? Because I'm heeding your prayers. Why are you heeding my prayers, Jesus? Because I don't listen to sinners, but worshipers of God, I do listen to. And you, my friend, are a worshiper of God. You have obeyed me. You listened and you were obeying me. You're going, like, this is what, you, this is, there it is. So either, according to your own explanation, which I 100% agree with you, Either it's true or we got to do something with all those verses and say, well, actually, no, it doesn't mean he doesn't heed them. But now we got to say he just doesn't hear them. Well, I can't say he doesn't hear them because God's omnipotent. He knows everything. He does hear them. But what does it mean? How do I make that fit here? Or does the Bible contradict? According to your own explanation, Aaron, God does not heed. He's not obliged to hear or listen to or even give an answer, or reply back. Your understanding, which is an accurate yeah. one. But here... Jesus Christ is hearing his prayers and Jesus Christ is answering his prayers. Why? Because he's not viewed as sinful in the eyes of God Almighty. This makes sense with everything else Paul says. The righteous live by faith. We're considered just as we never sinned when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about faith and all that stuff too. But you answered it for me. Yes, that's my point. My point exactly 
you made it. So is Ananias wrong? Okay. Now let's answer your question there. Now, yeah, that, now you're it, hung that, up on is Ananias wrong? Ananias is right. But again, I can eisegete the text. Wait, I can eisegete it and put in there what I think, right? Or I can read this in its narrative form of what it's, it is, a historical account of what happened. This is what happened, okay? This is literally what happened. Don't you think Paul talked to Ananias? Don't you think Ananias talked to Paul? Yeah. What did Ananias know? Well, according to this, he just knows he's coming, he's scared, and he's like, look. And so then what does Ananias do? He does what Christians are supposed to do, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he tells them that, right? My point to you is here's where you're going to get in a pickle because I'm reading this. He's talking to Ananias. He goes and meets with Ananias. But I'm going to go here. I want you to see this. Don't believe me. Believe the word. This is why grammatical, historical, hermeneutics but do you, matter. But I, I would say this. I would say, respectfully, you're not exegeting because I'm reading what the verse says. Why do you wait, rise, and be baptized yeah. and wash away your sin? You're saying that Ananias mm -hmm. was mistaken because Paul was already washed of his sin. In the eyes of God. I don't know. I, I, so I don't know how many so I can give you. First Corinthians 2 says, you don't know my heart. I don't know your heart. Only God knows my heart. Ananias is doing okay. what we are called to do. And he's doing what he's called so to do. Ask, so let me ask you this. So yes or no, is Ananias inspired when he speaks to Paul? I think when he's telling Paul what Jesus told him to tell him. Do, can in you find six, anywhere? Yeah. Can you find anywhere in any account where Jesus tells Ananias to go and baptize him? Where Jesus says, hey, Ananias, and also, you got to baptize him. Is that anywhere? In yeah, scripture? actually, I mean, well, he tells, so let me explain, maybe. Uh, where, wait, 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 before you go any further, where you said you, yes, where is it that Jesus tells Ananias to go baptize him? Okay, so here's what happens. Jesus tells uh, Ananias that there are some things that Paul is, it's appointed for him to do. You are trying to say, well, that means everything else except baptism. If you look at what the text says, you take Acts 9, mm -hmm. you take 22 and 26. Ananias told Paul many different things. He told him he's going to be apostle to the Gentiles. He told him he's going to turn people, Acts 26, from light, uh, from darkness to light, uh, to repent. In Acts 22, 16, Ananias tells him, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He, here's why I'm pressing you at this point for probably the last 40 press minutes. Me, please press me. Okay, I'm pressing you because... What you said in our previous discussion, and what I'm trying to get you to say again now, is that you're saying Ananias is inspired whenever he speaks to him about what God told Paul to do in, 20, in 9 and 26. But then when it comes to verse 16, you're saying, but that's I'm, not right. Now, my point is, like, when you say, is he inspired? I think that the uh, gospel writers are inspired. What Luke wrote here, he's inspired. And he, he, this is exactly what happened. This is the account. I don't think Judas was inspired by God to turn Jesus in. Do you think Judas was inspired when he says things? Now, I, th I think that God's providence and his no, sovereignty controls everything. Wait, wait, let me answer. I'm trying to answer well, you. But wait. I can't make my points because you're... So here's what's happening in Acts 22, 16. Mm -hmm. The point, you're making the point that Ananias is mistaken, right? Let's say no, he's... I'm not saying he's mistaken. So he's right. Paul is still in a sense. I'm saying he's right and he's doing what we do. We tell people, like, if I don't know someone is a Christian... And I share the gospel with them, and I tell them to call in the name of the Lord, put your faith in Jesus Christ, whatever I tell them, right? You tell them to be baptized. But they're yeah, like, but oh, I've already done that. But that we've discussed that already. There's oh. only two options. Either Paul is already forgiven. If he's already forgiven of his sins, then Ananias is wrong when he tells him to wash him away. If wait, Ananias wait, wait. is right, if Ananias is right, it's very simple. It's clear. If Ananias is right, then Paul's sins were not forgiven already. The only okay. way to reconcile it with your position is to say Ananias was wrong. Okay, which is, listen. Okay, well, let me let me ask you this. Let me just flip this around for you. Okay. According to your own, and we're we're gonna go. I want to go back and look at what Jesus said. Okay. So, let's just flip this coin around. I'm okay. saying. So let me be very clear. I'm saying Ananias is doing what he's called to do, to you know share with people and tell them make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, call the name of the Lord, and you'll be saved. That's what he's telling them to do because that's what wash away your sins is connected to the participle calling on the name of the Lord, wash away your sins. That's what he's doing. He's doing what all Christians do, the Great Commission, okay? That's what he's doing, right? 
So that's what he does. I'm not saying he's wrong for that at all. I am saying. That he's wrong when he says that he was so still innocent. Let me, again, Aaron, hear me out. If that's true. Okay, listen to me. Here's right. that's what you want to hold me to. I'm telling you, here's scripturally, Ananias doesn't know the heart of Paul. He doesn't know a lot of things. <clears throat> he only knows what Jesus has told him, as far as we know sure. from Scripture, sure. right? I, so, would, I would disagree because in Acts 9, you said that the, the, the fact that he was praying means he's saved. And God told Ananias that he was praying. Therefore, Ananias would know Paul was praying. So right. according to your own argument, Ananias right. would know Paul was saved. So if you're right. Remember earlier, now I'm going to hold you to it. And then we're going to look at something else, okay? And maybe we can I'd put love, this one. I'd love, I'd love for me, you to answer. Acts twenty two sixteen. I'm, I'm, right. I keep answering it, but like it's just. I mean, I'm sorry. My answer. You don't accept my answer. I'll give you the I, answer again. Let me give you the answer again, and I want to ask you something. Okay. Okay. Ananias is a human. I don't think he's inspired in the way like the Luke and and uh, Peter and James and John people who wrote the Bible. I don't think he's inspired in that sense. I think that God did give him a message to send to Paul, and he did okay. that. His message. What well, all what I can it? tell you. All it's I can tell you. Part of that message or not? What's is that? 20, is twenty two sixteen a part of the message? That's over that, the general yeah. great commission. Okay, that all Christians are to do. Listen, wait, hear me out. Hear me out, Aaron. Hear yeah. me out. Here's what I do know from just exegeting the text. Here's what Jesus actually said to do. Okay, this is what he's told to do, and we'll look at it in three accounts. Let me just go through it. Okay, let me just show you what. He is appointed to do. You will be told you have, what you are to do. Wait, here we go. Just please let me. Right? Okay. Okay. You're told what you're to do. Right? He's praying. And again, don't forget, you said what that means is he doesn't heed the prayer of sinners. But then you know that he's heeding this prayer, which means, is God wrong? Did God get it wrong, Aaron? You're asking me, did Ananias get it wrong? Here's how I'm telling you about Ananias. I'm saying Ananias is not God. I'm saying to you, 1 Corinthians 2 tells me and everyone who reads 1 Corinthians 2 that only God knows your heart and you know your heart. I'm telling you that Ananias does what God tells him to do, but then he says, hey, look, get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. He tells him that because that's what we're all to do when we go preach the gospel. It's the Great Commission. And so that's what he does. Generally, this is what all Christians do. But he was not commissioned by God to actually do that. There's nowhere in the text that Jesus says, okay, and also don't forget to baptize him. But you even said that when it talks about heeding the prayers of sinners, that means he, that means he's not obliged to do it because they're sinful people. But here you agree that he's heeding the prayer of I, Paul. I do not agree with your, what you're doing in Acts 9. Okay, I don't so agree. earlier though, you did say you were telling me what this, these verses mean, right? Do you, let me ask you this. When it says that God does not listen to the uh, prayers of sinners, but worship of God, worshipers of God he listens to, Here's what I believe. I believe that God hears everything, but what that's actually saying in its context, in this grammatical form, is that God doesn't heed and he's not obliged to do anything for any sinner like that. He doesn't heed their prayers. Is that accurate? Because earlier you well, said that, that's what it was. That's what I explained it earlier. Yeah. Okay, what so I you do agree with that. So now let me ask you this. Why? Why is he heeding his prayer? If he's still a sinner, sinner and not a worshiper of God? Because the Bible it says does, he doesn't. It doesn't say he's heeding it. What it says is that he basically tells Ananias, hey, there's a guy praying, which shows me that he's seeking the truth, and I'm going to send you to go and do what? What are the things that are appointed? It's. I think that you're saying God is – He's a, the, what, you're going to be told to do some certain things. And if you look at what the text says, there's multiple things, including arise and be baptized. But what you're doing is you're saying, no, 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 the text doesn't say he was appointed to do that. I mean, the fact that Ananias did it, and this is why I'm pressing you on this point, is that what you're saying, and you have repeated this a few times, and so maybe I'll just assume this is what you're saying, is that you're saying that Acts 22, 16, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You're saying that Ananias was just trying to fulfill the Great Commission. Therefore, he was right in what he was trying to do, but he was wrong in what he said. So we're wrong because, when we tell people that we don't know if they're believers or not to no, repent and be baptized? We're wrong? You're deflecting. In 2216. How am I deflecting? That's that's exactly the same situation Ananias is in. But wait, I let, would me, love let me look. I would love to explain. Right here. Right here. Please look at this. We know God is not listening to sinners, right? We, we've looked at that. Proverbs. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Is he hearing Paul's prayers in the sense of that word here? 
He's hearing it. He's heeding it. Is he doing that to Paul when he's actually answering his prayers on top of it? He is confirming that he's hearing it, and he's given him a vision that he's going to take care of him and give him his sight back. So this is what you're doing. And maybe you, I don't know if you. No, I'm using biblical theology. I'm using the whole Bible all in context because let's just look, well, let's do this. Let's do this. I, I would like, if I could have a couple minutes, I'd love to. Oh, I've given make. you plenty of minutes, but I've been trying to get here to Galatians one. Look at this real quick. So did he talk to Ananias? Did Paul talk to Ananias? I mean, do you, you want me to, in, in yeah, Acts 20, we've been talking about it for the last hour. And he, yeah. and he spoke to Ananias and Ananias spoke to him? Yes. Well, here is where Paul's given his explanation of his conversion and what he was sent to do, what he was appointed to do. And I want to look at Acts 26 as well next. But when he who had set me I, apart I, before I was born, called me by his grace, I, was pleased I, to reveal his son to me. What you're running from too. <laughs> we we said we were going to accomplish two things in 22. Mm-hmm. We were going to number one. We said we were before we moved on. We said we were going to define what it means to call the name of the Lord, and we also said that we were going to at least. I've been trying to get you to say, and you keep dodging it. But but you're saying it without saying it because you're saying in Acts nine, you're saying Paul was already saved, his sins were already forgiven because God hears his prayer. That's what you're saying. But then I'm in agreeing, Acts, 22- I'm agreeing with you, Aaron, that God doesn't heed. And he's not obliged to answer or listen to prayers of sinners or uh, unrighteous people. So I agree That's, with you, but the problem is Jesus is heeding his prayers and he's answering his prayers. So according to God and his word throughout a lot of scriptures, not just one, a lot of scriptures, he does not listen to those people. He doesn't heed them. He does, he's not obliged to answer them. But we see that Jesus is hearing it and, and oblige, he's obliging it. He's, he's answering his prayers. If what you're saying is true, then, then God's wrong and Ananias is right. Or you're wrong. I mean, that, that's basically the or point I'm, I'm making. And In God's actually, word's wrong. That doesn't mean that. that your understanding of, of heeding the prayers of sinners is no. wrong. But Trey, in Acts twenty two sixteen, I'm literally reading the text. Why do you wait? Rise and be baptized. And why? To wash away your sins. Wait a minute, Ananias. Paul's sins should have been forgiven already if he was saved. So that's why I'm getting you to admit that the only way that your position works is if you say in Acts twenty two sixteen, and this is what you said in our previous conversation because mm-hmm. I took note is that you said Ananias was mistaken. These are the these are from our first conversation. Mm-hmm. You said Ananias doesn't know what Paul had and hadn't done. Uh, Ananias tells Paul to call on God's name because he didn't know that Paul was saved already. Ananias was not aware that he'd already prayed. Well, we looked at he was aware. I said time. that. Jesus told yeah, him I, that he's praying. I, I took the notes, but anyway. I mean, that might have been Paul, one of your points to make, but I think that Ananias knew he was praying because... God tells him I'm, he's praying to me and I'm answering I, his prayers. Yeah. So Paul, then you said Paul was forgiven of his sins. And I just didn't know that. And here's why I think that's important because if you are making the point that Paul was already saved, then whenever Ananias says that he needs to have his sins forgiven, Ananias is, has to be wrong. But the reason I know Ananias isn't wrong is because it's not just the question of whether Ananias was inspired. There's three levels of inspiration here. First of all, Ananias, I believe fully is inspired. Um, if not, then that sort of opens the door to questioning almost every quote in the New Testament. Well, was this guy actually inspired? This is, no, this is inspired by God. the Bible, the Word of God, all Scripture okay, is inspired that's, by that's God. What I'm, that's what no I'm getting to. But I think there's so, like so. I'd love to finish this one point. This go ahead. One, this go ahead. Point. So, Ananias, the argument you're making is that Ananias says Paul's in his sins when he's not. Paul's already forgiven. Mm-hmm. So. Second level of inspiration is that, like we discussed earlier, this is Paul telling his story. So Paul, obviously, everybody, no one's going to argue Paul's not inspired. So in Acts 22, 16, you have three levels of inspiration. You have Ananias, who I believe is inspired, and I think Ananias does know what he's talking about. And he says, Paul, you need to rise and be baptized. To what? To wash away your sins. In doing so, you're calling on his name. Second level of inspiration, Paul is the one telling his story. This is his defense before the Jerusalem mob where he's getting you know, beaten tw- end of chapter 21. He stands up and he addresses the Jerusalem mob. So Paul is telling his own conversion story. I have a hard time believing that Ananias was mistaken and that Paul, who's inspired, would then later tell his account and, and mm-hmm. point out that Ananias told me, arise, be baptized, and wash away my sins. I'm pretty sure if Ananias told that to Paul, if Ananias, if Ananias told Paul that, and Paul knew, well, actually, Ananias was wrong. I was already saved. 
I have a hard time seeing Paul repeat that in Acts 22, 16 in his own defense. He's telling his conversion story. And the fact that you have Luke, who's an inspired writer, who records it. So you have three mm -hmm. levels of inspiration in Acts 22, 16. You have Ananias, who's inspired, telling Paul that he is not saved from his sins yet. He needs to arise and be baptized to wash away those sins. He's mm -hmm. not saved already. You have Paul, who's confirming that by repeating it in his explanation. And thirdly, you have Luke, who records it. If Ananias was wrong, and Ananias said, look, I was just trying to preach. I was just trying to fulfill the Great Commission. And I told Paul to rise and be baptized and wash away his sins. And Paul later I found Lord. Paul was actually saved already. Then I don't think Paul would have repeated it to a giant crowd to give them the impression that Paul had to be baptized to have his sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. Or the third level, I don't think Luke would have recorded it. Now, that's my main point that I've been trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for maybe it, maybe I should have said made that three levels of inspiration yeah. earlier. That's but funny. the other thing is, can you take scripture and define calling on his name for me? And then can I take scripture and define calling on his name? Because what? in okay. the last in the last 45 minutes or so, um, you have continued to say that um, calling on his name is the only participle is only connected to wash away your sins. So you would say, well, to call on his name is to wash away your sins. I actually agree with you. We're just going to disagree on what calling on his name means because, mm -hmm. you know, in, there, that's found, I think, three times. I mean, in Scripture, um, calling on his name, I'm talking about in the New Testament as far as conversions. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Is it a prayer? Well, it can't be because unless you're going to take the position Ananias is wrong because Paul had already been praying Acts 9 11 for approximately three days, right? He's been fasting for three days. So Paul's already been praying, and yet Ananias says, You haven't called on his name yet. Um, uh, where in scripture is calling on his name referenced in other places? Yeah. Acts chapter. I'm going I'm to stop you real quick because I'm not going to go into the calling on his name yet because I'm still trying to get to, you know, like, look, I get that you don't agree with my understanding and my me saying yeah, yeah. that. That God um, doesn't listen to sinners and he doesn't heed their call, but yet he's heeding his call. Sure. He's heeding his prayers. Because why? Because he's forgiven. Why? Because he has faith. All those things that is throughout all of Scripture. And we'll get to it later, all those things. But you have a hard time to think that somebody's missing, you know, that Ananias is just mistaken. And I'm not but saying he's so mistaken. I'm saying he's doing what, what he's called to do. Let me, let me ask Let me just. He was mistaken. He either was or he wasn't. Okay. Well, let me ask you something. Let me, let, well, hold on. So was he I get mistaken? It. I get it. I get it. No, again, was I've answered you a hundred times. I'm not going to answer it again. You just don't like it. That's fine. I, I get it. But let me ask you a question. Okay. Read this to me. Read. Start with verse 13, please. This is Galatians chapter 1. 13. Okay. Or you've heard of my former life. What time do you have to go? How long can you go to? Another hour? Yeah, I can go to about 3.50. Okay, okay that's perfect. Uh, Galatians 1.13. For you've heard of my former life in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to, dis to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own uh, age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father, obviously Judaism. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Stop right there, please. Stop right there. A um, couple things. Again, what is he appointed to do? not be baptized. It's appointed to be the apostle to the Gentiles and to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That's in Acts well, just, 9. That's in, just, that's in Acts 22, and that's in Acts 26, and it's in Galatians 1. But here, I want to point out this. You see that green box I have highlighted right there? Uh, I did oh, not I immediately looking. consult with anyone. Is he mistaken? Yeah. Or is he lying? Is this not inspired, Aaron? Well, of course it's inspired, Trey. Okay, but I know. That's what my point. I I'm think sorry. I'm sorry. That, that, that did come across as a turd. Oh, no, I no, no. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't take it that way. But here, no, but, he says this. Okay, so here's, look. Yeah, when he would set me apart before I was born, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. This is Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. Yeah. And we're going to read 26. We hadn't even looked at that yet. In order sure. that I might preach him among the Gentiles, why did he call him out? Well, he in order to preach him among the Gentiles. That makes sense with 9. That makes sense with 22 and 26 of Acts. That's what he was appointed to do. Then he but says this. Erase. I did not immediately it consult with anyone. It doesn't erase 22, 16. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not, I'm not trying to get it. Like my point is this right here. Did he okay. consult with anyone after that, after his vision of Jesus and after Jesus set him apart to be an apostle to the Gentiles and to preach him among the Gentiles? 
verse 17 and 18, because that's that's the context of I did not immediately consult with anyone. That doesn't mean he didn't talk to Ananias. Obviously, he talked to Ananias. If you look at verse 17, he's continuing the context. The, the whole context of the book of Galatians is how, and this is another, this will take longer than an hour, is that we're justified by the gospel, faith in Christ, not the law of Moses. That's what the, if you read in Galatians 1 and 2, that's the problem they had is these guys from Jerusalem, the Judaizers came in and basically I were, understand, believe me. I would say that you you followed the Galatian heresy of faith plus baptism instead of faith plus circumcision. But my, here, my point here, he says, I did not consult immediately. I didn't immediately consult with anyone. Now, so what's, here's when, here's what is when that Galatians, mean? Galatians was written in 55 AD, okay? What does that mean, what does that mean to you, though? He, I did not consult with anyone. Are you trying to say that means he didn't talk to Ananias? Oh, oh no, no, no. no here, here's, <laughs> my point is this right here. I think a grammatical, historical, hermeneutic, and understanding the context of everything, right? And not just in this particular thing, but understanding biblical theology and all of it, that we can really get a good understanding of what's going on here. So he wrote that in, in, in 55 AD, Okay. okay. He wrote the book of Acts in 64 AD. So for nine okay. years, people were thinking he never consulted anyone. That's what it says. That's what it, he never consulted anyone. And then nine years later, you get the book of Acts by Luke. And it says, well, actually, he. so I don't think these people are like saying, oh, this Bible is not inspired. He made a mistake. I can't imagine him making a mistake because he actually okay. said this. No, it's, it's so context you, of it all. All context. Are, right? Is the point you're trying to make that if Galatians was written prior, that it's, no, no, it's not that doesn't make sense. The my events point, of Acts. The events of Acts happened before the writing of Galatians. No, the no, here's, events, my point. here's my point. I'm not saying no, Ananias I, made a mistake. I'm saying, again, he doesn't know the heart of people. He's just doing what he's called. He did what he was called to do by Jesus. He told him what he was supposed to do. He's going to be set apart to be preaching the gospel to, to the Gentiles. And then he just does what all Christians are supposed to do, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is what he did. Now, my point, my only point is saying here in Galatians 1, he says, I didn't, I, when that happened, I didn't consult with anyone. But just imagine nine seven? years. Huh? Can you read 17? Can you read 17? Yeah. Nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Exactly. Okay. okay. My, 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 here's my point. My point is okay. this. When they first got this letter in Galatia in 55 AD, I would bet if they're not going to insert things into the Bible and they're just reading it, for what it says, because they don't have a complete, they don't have all the canon, right? They're thinking he didn't consult immediately with anyone. And so they probably wouldn't know anything about Ananias. How would they know anything about Ananias? Nine years later, Acts is written, just say somebody from Galatia gets the book of Acts, right? And they read it and they're like, dude, he actually talked to Ananias. I don't think they're questioning God's word or mistakes. I think they're getting a better picture of a broader understanding of things. Can I ask you a question? You obviously think that they had miraculous gifts at this time, correct? Mm Mm-hmm like first century. Mm-hmm. I mean, because it sounds like it sounds like what you're saying is nobody would have known what Acts said until 60s when Luke wrote it. And I'm I would say there's some people that didn't know other people who experienced it knew it. But that, I mean, that would make sense if they weren't miraculous gifts. But, you know, in the, in the New Testament, there were miraculous gifts given by laying on the apostles hands, Acts 8, 18, Acts 19, one through six, like they had miraculous gifts that would teach have so that the people in all the different areas could teach until the new Testament canon was actually like finished being written. So Mm -hmm. the idea that somebody would read Galatians one 17, uh, and say, I didn't confer with anybody verse 16. And somehow like that doesn't make sense to me because it wouldn't matter whether they had the book of acts fully written yet, because in the first century they had the miraculous gifts. So they'd be able to teach. So I also think if you look, if you look at the context, I don't yeah. know what your point is. So, yeah. Well, I guess my point is that what you were saying is, well, Galatians was written in, what did you say, 55? Is that what mm-hmm. your that position? Okay, 55. So Galatians is written in 55. Acts isn't written till 62. What'd you, what, 64? Yeah, 64. I know it's all like relative, but so, okay, Galatians is written first. Okay. And Galatians says, I didn't consult with anyone. Therefore, when they read uh, Acts 10 years later, They'd be like, wait, wait, what a minute. Wait, I, he talked with Ananias? What's, I mean, first of all, they had the miraculous gifts. So nobody would have been, I think they would have had all that knowledge before Luke even f- finished compiling it. Um, because 1 Corinthians 14 talks about they would teach, you know, by the Holy Spirit's miraculous inspiration. Um, second of all, the acts of, a, uh, the events of Acts happened way before Galatians. I mean, I wouldn't say all of them because, you know, Paul's imprisoned at the end of Acts 28, but like, 
you know, Acts I get nine. All that. That's not my point. I get all that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so I don't get. The, I know. I know Acts, but listen. So all that. Look. Let's look. Let's just really quick uh, look at Acts twenty six because I want to. There's a sure. lot of baptism we got to go through, and it's probably going to be more episodes because I want to go sure. deep into sure. deep into baptism uh, oh, yeah. and when you're actually saved. But let's look at uh, again. I'm trying to attack your position that his appointment was to be baptized. I'm, I'm just like, nope, that's not his appointment. Acts 9, it was appointed to be a prophet and an apostle to the Gentiles. Acts 22 to the Gentiles. Galatians 1 to the Gentiles. Now we're here in Acts 26. Okay? Sure, sure. So, so why are you persecuting me? <clears throat> it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, <clears throat> I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Rise, stand up on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose. To appoint, there's that word again, you, sure. not to get baptized, but for you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. This makes complete sense with Acts 9, 22, and Galatians 1. Delivering oh, yeah. you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness and, and to the light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among the those who are sanctified by faith in me, not by baptism in me, but by faith in me. And this is where we're going to get into, again, it's the battle of the definitions of words. You say faith means also baptism, and you want to use synecdoche and all that stuff. And we're going to look at that, and we're going to see if it actually makes sense. But according to Jesus here, here's why I'm setting you apart. To go to the Gentiles, right here, because I'm sitting there to open their eyes, so that they may turn from the darkness to the light, power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And then he goes on, he shares it. And look at this. He says, uh, uh, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of mind. You, your great learning is driving you out of your mind. King Agrippa says this. Do you believe the, uh, he, says to, he says to King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in, short term, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian, not baptize me to be a Christian. Would you persuade me? Like, you think that these words that you're telling me that I'm going to believe, you know, have faith, like have faith and have forgiveness of sins. King Agrippa, do you believe? Do you? And Agrippa said, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Like how, you can't persuade, like, according to you, you can't persuade. Like what's, is this inspired? Is Agrippa inspired? Is he wrong? Is he inspired by God? No, Back to Agrippa's you. not. Agrippa's no. not? No. So do you think, do you, do he you said think this though, right? Did, did, did Agrippa say these words, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Yeah, but Agrippa is not a representative of God. Like but Ananias. Luke wrote that down. Yeah. He's inspired. So I think, okay, but here's what you're saying though. So he's wrong. So Agrippa's wrong that he's, he's misunderstanding Paul's um, gospel presentation here. Although he's not said anything about being baptized in him, but he should have known you can't be persuaded to be a Christian, Agrippa. You have to be baptized to be a Christian. But here, let me, this is what you're doing repeatedly, which is, you know, let's say you have a box, right? I got a mug right here. Let's say you got a mug, all right? Mm -hmm. And so let's say this is the salvation mug, right? You see a verse that says, like this one here about faith, right? You see a verse of, with faith, forgiveness of sins. Yeah, you among put those it all in there plus baptism. I don't. No, I, Paul put it in there in Galatians 3, which we can go to if you wanted to go in Galatians. But So you have... John 3, 16, whoever believes, we both put it in the mug, right? Um, you have to have repent, repentance unto life. Well, actually, I used to we get to ask as well. I would say but not but, a mug. I would say a nutshell. And in your nut, I, when I was in the Church of Christ, I'd say in your nutshell, you put here, you got to hear, you got to believe, got to confess. Don't you believe that you have to have faith? Yeah. Well, what's the difference? Because I believe that you also have to be baptized. So put that in the nutshell too, right? So it doesn't matter whether you used it when you are in the church of Christ or not, what matters is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And when you get to Acts 22, 16, still, we have not answered this. And I feel like we're doing everything <laughs> to go to appointment here and we're running from it. In Acts 22, 16, it says Paul was still in his sins and you have Ananias saying it. And you've, you've stated that Ananias was mistaken and that and and Paul was, he was just doing what we're called to do. So he, so he, what Paul was in his sins or Paul was not in his sins. No, because I don't Paul. think I think God was listening and heeding his prayers, like you said, because he doesn't listen to sinners or heed their prayers. But he was listening and heeding the so, prayers of Paul. 
And First Corinthians 2 says we don't know the heart of man, but only God knows our heart. So Ananias doesn't know the heart of Paul. Uh, you've heard it. You can rewind it and watch it a thousand times. Yes. So what you're saying, though, is Acts 22, 16. Why are you waiting for? Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Okay. And you're saying, well, Ananias, or you're saying Paul was already forgiven. So Paul wasn't in his sins, but Ananias wasn't wrong. Oh, well, you can't have both ways. Either Paul was still in his sins or Ananias was wrong. So God I mean, was wrong. Say, so he no, was listening, but he doesn't listen to sinners. He doesn't heed their prayers. You said, you said Ananias wasn't inspired earlier. I said he was inspired. I'm saying and I said Paul was inspired when he repeated it, and Luke was inspired when he wrote it. I'm saying Ananias was inspired to do what when God said, Thus say the Lord, right? And tell Peter, I mean, tell Paul this. What was he sent to do with Paul? Give him his sight back. That doesn't and change. Tell him he's anything. gonna be he's gonna be the disciples to the nations of the Gentiles. You can Acts, you can read Acts 26 all day long, and it's of course it's inspired and the things mm -hmm. that Jesus said to Paul. But that doesn't somehow mean Acts 22, 16 magically doesn't mean what it says. Mm -hmm. And you know this, that in then exegesis comes for her hermeneutics. What the text says comes first, and then exactly. what it means, secondly, what the text says in Acts 22, 16 is that Ananias was sent by God. That Ananias is sent by God, and he tells Paul that Paul's still in his sins. I mean, that's what the text says. So the idea of saying, well, I know calling the text on his said... Name. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. I want to talk about that because calling on his name, you know, you mentioned it. You brought up Romans 10, 13. Uh, it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a quotation from Joel 2, 32. Peter, another inspired apostle in Acts 2, he quotes that same passage in Acts 2, 21 it is. So Acts 2, 21 and... Uh, Romans 10, 13 are both a quotation of Joel 2, 32, right? So in Acts 2, what does it mean? If you define, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Think about it this way. Does it mean a prayer or trust in Jesus? You already said that Paul trusted in Jesus and he was already saved and he was praying. <clears throat> so if, that, if that's true, then Ananias was also wrong, according to your theory, about telling him to call on his name. My theory fits perfectly. Because in Acts 2.37, after preaching, go to, you want to go to Acts 2? Yeah. Okay. Acts 2.21. So for anyone listening, Trey and I both know the context. Jesus, Luke 24.47, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he says in Act Luke 24.47-49, basically, go to Jerusalem and wait for the power, the promise of the Father, which is the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's going to cause them to be inspired. And so they go repentance and, will be preached for the forgiveness of sins, right? Yeah. Repentance, don't forget, yeah. Don't forget that part. Repentance well, yeah, I mean, for the forgiveness of sins. Okay. Well, I believe repentance is necessary. Let's go to Acts 2.38 and elaborate on this. So in uh, Acts 2.21, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a quotation from Joel 2.32. If you got a footnote, if you don't, that's where it's from. And then in verse 22, Peter keeps preaching, and he talks about Jesus, a man attested to you by God with mighty miracles and wonders and signs. Um, verse 24, uh, he was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him. He talks about the death, the murdering of Jesus. He talks about David's uh, writing that was uh, talking about Christ. Verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, he has poured out this that you now, uh, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So he promised in John, there's a passage in John 20 that I think is is prophetic that John 20, 22, where it says breathe on them. But obviously, if you look later at Luke 24, Luke 24, 47, which is after that, Jesus says, you're going to receive it in Acts 2. And in Acts 2, it's finally poured out on them, right? So, so basically, breathe the it on them and they receive the Holy Spirit or do you not breathe on them? No, I, I think that was prophetic. And the reason that you would see that is because it doesn't happen until Acts 2. And Jesus, so even himself in Luke 24. Wait, real quick. That's a, I'll okay. make you a deal. Can we, wait, 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 can wait, we get back? Like, so John 20, what is it where he says he breathes on him? It's 2022. And when he said these, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So you're saying that that's prophetic, what's going to happen in Acts 2. I would say that they received yeah. the indwellment of the Holy Spirit right here. And then the the gifts of the Spirit, like the, the speaking in tongues and all that stuff, happen in Acts 2 with them. But I would say, I don't know why this would be, he breathed on them and said to them, receive it, not you will receive it, but receive the Holy Spirit. That's how they received yeah. the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, I'm okay with that, may, I mean, but you're saying no, they didn't receive it until Acts 2. We may, 
yeah, we may disagree on that mm-hmm. because I, I mean, I'm not, the, you know, it's not like I came up with this, you know, there's lots of mm-hmm. W.E. Vine, Frank Pack, all those guys, they, they, they're they not members of the Church of Christ and they agree. They say it's symbolic and prophetic okay. Pentecost. I think that I'm that's more about, in, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. It's like, that could be another topic for discussion, mm-hmm. but like, you know, I would look at Luke 24, 49, um, where he says, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. So either way, even if we disagree on that John 20 thing in Acts 2, you've got Acts 2.21. He quotes Joel 2.32 and says, it shall come to pass. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? Whoever does that will be saved. He keeps preaching about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, verse 33, Peter says, hey, this is the promised Holy Spirit, which you now see and hear, which is referencing the miraculous tongues. And then in verse 36, and this is the other text that we discussed before us, um, on our other Zoom calls. Therefore, let all Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. So my take on this chapter right now is verse 21. And obviously I'm summarizing a lot, but Peter says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? And then in verse 36, they hear this preaching about Jesus, how they murdered the Messiah. And verse 37, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? First of all, there's your Adelphoi there, men and brethren. Uh, men and brethren, what shall we do? So in Acts 2.21, Peter, an inspired apostle, says, you're going to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. The people hear the preaching about Jesus, and they say, hey, what do we do? I would interpret that as, how do, you, how do we call on the name of the Lord? We want to be saved. What do we do? And Peter's response, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus mm-hmm. Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say this. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord in Acts 22, 16, right? Does it mean to have trust in Jesus? You would say Paul already did that. And yet Ananias told him he needed to call on the name of the Lord to have his sins forgiven, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, If you say it's prayer. Some people say Romans 10, 13, which is a quotation of the same Joel verse in the Old Testament, the minor prophet. They would say, well, that means to pray a prayer or to call out to God or, you know, it's the sinner's prayer or it's not the sinner's prayer, but it's your genuine trust and just a calling to God, you know, whatever you want to describe it. And I would say Paul already did that in Acts 9, 11. And yet Ananias says he hasn't called on the name of the Lord yet. I think when you put Acts 2, Acts 22, 16, Romans 10, 13 together, that what it means to call on the name of the Lord is to appeal to him. First Peter 3, 21, you're appealing to God. Uh, that's what the word means there. So in First Peter three twenty one. So at least in when I say, hey, define biblically what it means to call in the name of the Lord. It is always appealing to God through a sacrifice. Um, in the Old Testament, Abraham built an altar and called on God. What did he do? He offered a sacrifice. He was appealing to God through a sacrifice. And I think that's what First Peter three twenty one says about baptism, because it says baptism, the like figure to Noah's flood. The verses previous. Uh, it now, what is baptism? I can't do? wait it to now, talk about First Peter three twenty one. We do not have time today to do that. But yeah, I, I know you're right. right. How about I just? How about right? I leave Peter three alone for then, and let's just Acts twenty two. Mm-hmm. So, or sorry, Acts two. No, mm-hmm. don't don't worry. I'm not taking you back. To well, Acts we're gonna have to pick again. up also on Acts two as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do but you let's want? Just, let's just chop it up as much as we can right now, though. Okay. So, well, do you want to keep going, or do you want to no, chop it now? No. Let's no. okay. we'll keep going for a little bit, so, and then we'll so, we got about thirty more minutes. Okay, so in Acts two thirty eight, which is where mm-hmm. we're at now, um, you know, we could we I'd love to talk about this one. Um, we talked about it previously in the um, our last discussion, and so you know, I made the same point then. Acts two twenty one, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter preaches, verse thirty seven, their hearts were pricked, and they asked what to do. In Acts two thirty eight, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. You can quote this too uh, for the forgiveness remission of your sins, and so. Maybe you could just for a while talk because I've been talking. Tell me what you think Acts two thirty eight means. Tell, if you can tell me when they're saved, are they saved when their hearts were pricked? Are they saved after that, etc.? Mm, this is a good one. Yeah. So, uh, brothers, what shall we do? Right. Okay. You know, Acts sixteen thirty. They ask the same question, brothers. Sure. What shall we do to be saved? He says, sure. believe, you know, what does sure. it say? He says, believe in the Lord believe Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Your house. So, cool. you know, again, it's, it's, it's biblical theology, not proof texting here and here, trying to find the baptism verses. 
um, there's more people in, in Acts. This is what's crazy to me. And I believed it with all my heart when I was in the church of Christ that everybody in the book of Acts was baptized. And I'm like, well, I believed it because, you know, elder so-and-so who I loved and look up to told me that. And so surely he knows what he's talking about. Come to find out there's way more people not baptized that we don't read about their being baptized in the book of Acts than they are being baptized. But we know the verses that show baptism. That's all we know. So here's the, the, the big question here. And this is what we're obviously going to have to really get into in the next one. And we'll probably dive into this right now. Totally. And then pick it up <clears throat> next time. Because 30 minutes is not going to be able to do it. This is where me and you, and like, so when you're talking to a regular Americanized Baptist, not a historical okay. Baptist, okay? Okay. Um, this is like when I was in the Church of Christ, I actually baptized a Baptist preacher. Cool. That was a notch on my belt, buddy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I baptized a Baptist preacher. But it's it's kind of easy because their their understanding is pretty close to yours. I mean, because they say, well, you have to you have to ask Jesus in your heart, right? Don't you sure. have to do that? Like, yeah, like a like, free will, like someone who's not Calvinistic, not Reformed. Yeah, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to do that. I say Calvinistic. I don't mean that slanderously because I know you, of course, think it's biblical. So I know listen, I, I don't listen mean to me. I'm gonna, let me say this for the record. I'm going to say like Doug Wilson said. I will walk. I will wake up in the morning. I'll crawl on my own hand, on my hands and knees over broken glass to call myself a Calvinist. Uh, you know, uh, Charles Spurgeon said that Calvinism is just a nickname that people has given the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, it's all biblical. So sure, call it whatever it would, you want. Like, it would be like someone calling us Campbellites or Campbellism, mm -hmm. right? We would say it's biblical. Yeah. Right. So, sure. so if you call me a Campbellite, I wouldn't get. I mean, I yeah. wouldn't bother. Me. I wouldn't Campbellite. agree. With you. So. Um, yeah. Water so, yeah. So, I mean, whatever. Call me whatever. Um, okay. So here's where we're, you, know, you tell them, you, you, you do them the, the dog and pony show, the, the baptism verses and everything. And you're like, it says you have to call on your name, right? Don't you think you have to ask Jesus in your heart? And they're like, yeah. Don't you think you have to confess? Yeah. Well, those are things you have to do is what you're saying. And they're like, yeah. Well, why would you take baptism out of that? And they're like, easy, easy peasy, you know? Sure. And the sure. only ones you really don't get are the ones who were just, you know, stick to their guns. Thank God. But if they really want to study it, and this is why I tell people, you got to be cra you got to be careful. If you if you have bad theology, you're going to get sucked into that because they're going to try to convince you. And it, you know, they went to their proof text. I mean, if you don't understand it, they might get you. But when you're dealing with someone like me, a Reformed Baptist, a true Baptist, a historical Baptist, a 1689 London Baptist, a uh, a abstract of principles Baptist, a Baptist faith and message of 2000, just the historical Baptist, the true reformers, right? Protestants, okay. Protestants. That stuff don't work on me. And here's why we, me and you, or how about this? If I was you years ago when I was in the Church of Christ, this is where I'd have had a problem talking to myself because we're coming at it from two different angles. I mean, I mean completely opposite places. Because I would believe back then, you like mean, you believe, the reform perspective, like you're. Yeah, is that what yeah. you mean? Well, I mean, right. when I say reform perspective, I'm I'm arguing historical and biblical. Like we can rain down scriptures on this, okay, and show you all your inconsistencies when you, we get really dive deep into doctrine and theology, and show okay. you your inconsistencies. I mean, right now we're just hitting this one verse, and we're like, well, what does it say? What does it say? What does it say? Well, let's just look at all this and let's try to put this thing together. But a, a church of Christ like yourself. You do not believe that sins were forgiven until you get baptized, correct? I mean, I guess it depends on what angle you're asking that. I don't believe I don't believe a individual sins are forgiven in the since Acts two, the, the Christian covenant, the new covenant promise of Jeremiah thirty one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't believe that. Like, I don't believe anyone's sins are forgiven until they contact the blood of Christ. And, and you I believe, believe that's in baptism. Yeah, because you've got parallels. You've got. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus Christ shed his blood for the remission of sins, Asaphis and Harmartion. How many exactly. did you shed that for, by the way? In, in Acts 2, 38. Uh, what did you say? When he said this is the blood of covenant, which was shed for how many? What do you mean? In Matthew 26, 28? No, no well, in the, when he's up in the upper room. Yeah, Matthew supper. Shed for many. So, yeah, not for every, right? Yeah, but you know you know that the scripture. We'll talk about it. We'll, talk, we'll, get, we'll get to it. Um, so yeah. check this out. Here's my point. Well, just, before you confuse somebody and leave it, the scriptures use many and all many times interchangeably. Um, so, um, but anyway. Yeah. 
So when when were the people's sins forgiven in the Old Testament? Like how were their sin how were how were the people in the Old Testament sins forgiven? Well, I mean, I'm going to read it to you from Romans 3. Obviously, Hebrews 10 says that uh, their sins, the blood of bulls and goats, didn't take away sin. Um, Mm -hmm. So if I go to... uh, It's verse 25. Whom God set forth, talking about Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation, satisfaction of the just, that word's mercy seat in the Septuagint, um, a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance... God had passed over the sins previously committed to demonstrate at the present time God's righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I mean, I think that you could say, you know, Abraham, right? Uh, Abraham was faithful under the covenant he lived under, which was patriarchy. Um, And so the blood of Christ, I don't know if a credit card is a good analogy, but the blood of Christ forgave and saved Abraham, even though it hadn't happened. You know what I mean? Like God was looking forward to the cross to save Mm -hmm. Abraham's sins. Because obviously Hebrews 10 says that the blood of bulls and goats wouldn't take away sins. Exactly. So Romans yeah. 10 is very clear that the blood of bulls and goats does not take away sins. So where were you reading right there in Romans 3? I was Romans 3. I don't know. I picked up about verse 25, yeah. 25 to 26. To, before our next one, I've got to clean up my computer because it's running so slow. Oh, with yeah. This, all these programs. But um, so right here. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Um, right. So again, when were just, I mean, you said it, but I think there's a lot of words there just for the people sure. listening short and quick and sweet. When were their sins actually forgiven? Uh, the ones prior, the like Testament. Abraham, Old Testament. Yeah. I'd say the cross when Jesus shed his blood, but I mean, like, I guess it, it's, it's, if you want, I guess I'm trying to answer it. I think Abraham was saved when he died. Right. Like, no, no. I don't think. Yeah, because because God because knew God was Jesus forward to the cross, right? Yeah, this is omniscient. He's Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation yeah. of the world. So it's like so God, he's he saved. He was justified by faith. Now, yes. did he did he do things? Like, of course, he does things. Every, believers do things. You know, faith, yeah. saving faith in God Almighty, um, produces obedience. Obedience never produces obedient faith. Faith produces obedience. So he had faith, and he was righteous before God because of faith. And all the sacrifices that all of Israel did, we read in Hebrews, that none of those sacrifices, now they thought that that was actually doing something, right? They thought that their sacrifices, that's what they had to do to have their sins forgiven and atoned for. Leviticus 16, uh, the Day of Atonement. But come to find out through progressive revelation and God's Word, and we understand that actually God was passing over that. He was in his forbearance. Why? Because he knew the true lamb was coming, right? And the true high priest, the true prophet, the true king. And their sins were actually forgiven at the cross of Jesus Christ in reality. In reality, right? Yeah. In God's That's reality. That went backwards and forwards. Right, 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 right. So God's reality is more real than our reality, right? Sure. And uh, so let's not forget Old Testament. Nothing they did. Forgive their sins, nothing. It was only what Christ did by his life, living the law perfectly, dying for those sins of the people who would believe in him and trust in him. He was the propitiation. The blood he shed was for us, and he died for our guilt and our shame. It's the doctrine of the atonement, okay? Sure. And, okay, so it's the doctrine of the atonement. And at the cross is when I was reconciled to God. Like you would say that you were reconciled to God when you're baptized. If I, you know, next time when we get together, I'm just letting you know. Yeah, it's from whose perspective? Yeah, like from from God's perspective, I believe that God knows all from the foundation of the world. He knew that the plan is going to happen with Jesus. I believe, as crazy as it is, and I, I'm not. I think open is open theism that what people call it. They think God doesn't know the future. He limits mm-hmm. himself or something. I don't believe that. So you know, like, how is it that God knew? 
that I was going to, and from my perspective, you know, I don't believe we're totally, yeah. Which, I mean, that just, I mean, I think he's God, right? I think that he's more, yeah, because he's God. I mean, I, I think that God is that powerful that he can give people free will and still know how, I mean, I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, it's maybe that's why I can't wait to talk about it. I can't wait to talk about it with you. But, um, so So, yeah, from my perspective, uh, when I was, you know, I mean, I was baptized when I was 12. I've told this before on the podcast. Um, and then, um, but like, you, okay, you know this. Well, how old were you when you were baptized? Eight. And then eight. I got indoctrinated in the Church of Christ at 21. And for the next 18 years, you know, so I was baptized again at, at 21 yeah. or 20, so 20 years old. Say, I would say when I'm, you know, when I'm 12 years old and I'm baptized, with a uh, knowledge of, you know, obviously prerequisites, you know, you know, I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm, expl- I forget that like, you know what I'm going to say. So uh, belief, repent, confession, and baptism. Right. So I would say from my earthly perspective, that's when my sins were pardoned. Now from God's perspective, I feel like, feel like when God said, let there be light in Genesis one, he knew in 20, I don't even know what the math is 20 and 20 in 1996. Right. So I guess that's the, I don't know if that's like from two different perspectives. Um, yeah, well, you're but getting actually, close. You're getting close to the doctrine of atonement. You're getting really close, and you, and I'm just going to tell you, you got to be very careful, Aaron, because the more you study that out, and I, I think have a better understanding of the doctrine of atonement and what actually happened there. Mm-hmm. Things start shifting and changing for you. Um, it did for me. Uh, so again, when were their sins really forgiven? Like really, really, when were they forgiven? So Acts two, Acts two though. Is and I know maybe you're. Is this is this is this setting up Acts two? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Sorry. Continue. So when were they, when their, when their sins for forgiven? Like really? I mean, I would say it's the same thing. I'd say from God's perspective, God knew those who were going to obey, but from their perspective, like in verse 40, Peter says, save yourselves or be saved, mm-hmm. depending on what translation you want. So, but in I mean, that again, sta- well, again, let me just stop you right there real quick. Just let me ask you a question. You don't think you can save yourself. Nobody does. Nobody in any kind of Christian faith says that you can save yourself. No, so not by word. You can't earn it or merit it. But I exactly. do think if, but Peter is saying in verse 40, save yourselves. What does Peter mean by that? He doesn't mean do something that will earn or merit salvation. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's sort of the whole idea of you, salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. You can't do anything to earn it or merit it, right? But like I look at it, salvation is a gift, Romans six twenty three. Well, think about the Old Testament. Joshua is a great example. Joshua 6, they're up to Jericho. God says, I have given you this city. It was a gift. Mm-hmm told them to receive this gift. What do you have to do? March around the city once and then seven times. And then the walls fell down. Well, they had to do something to receive the gift God gave them, but that didn't any way, way, any way make them earn it. Like they didn't, the walls didn't like knock down and they were just like, yeah, we earned it. Like Mm -hmm. obviously God did the work, but God set terms for them to meet. So I would say the same thing in Acts 2, you know, that God said, hey, I am doing the saving. Colossians 2, that baptism is a work, a working of God. I think ESV maybe say powerful work. I'm not sure. Baptism, God does the work in baptism, right, spiritually, by applying the blood of Christ. But am I required to do something on my side? Yeah, I think I am. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't, have it, but I'm still required to do it, just like Joshua 6. Yeah. So what I want to do <clears throat> next time is really dive deep into uh, uh, the Acts doctrine two. of atonement. I want okay. to, um, and we can talk about any, you know, and I want to get deeper into baptism, right? And define words and go through it. Like, let's just see what, how you define faith, how you define sure. baptism, believe, justification, those things. We'll look at those sure. terms and we'll put it in there because, again, I'm going to hold you to the fire on that one. And yeah. uh, I think so I'm going to make a note. Yeah. So I've got, let me, let me find my tray note. Tray notes. I don't have any errand notes. What does that mean? I tray get, notes. I should get some I mean, air notes, but I'm going to hold you the fire on those definitions of words. And, um, Deal. okay. And secondly, but, I want to talk about, obviously I want to talk about the doctrine of atonement and, atonement. um, how Finding you know, eventually, terms. eventually we're Based. going to get to how I believe you're preaching a false gospel and why that is right. Because the gospel is news, right? Sure. Gospel means sure. what? Good news. Right. You angelion. You means good and angelion. <clears throat> Word angel, messenger, so good right. message. So it's good news. Mm-hmm. And I want to um, paint the picture of how your good news isn't really good news. Um, and it's not even news. I mean, it's, it's not. And so I know you don't see that. You don't believe that. I know that, right? So I don't think sure. you're a malicious and all that stuff. 
I think you really believe what you believe to be true. And I do as well. Um, but I do have an understanding of where you're coming from and why you believe what you believe, right? Um, so <clears throat> our sins are actually in reality forgiven at the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay. Right? We're reconciled to God at the cross. Okay. Not when we're baptized. See, because as this is why you got to understand like where I'm coming from. I don't think you really do. I don't think you have a good understanding of where I'm coming from, from a reform perspective, a historical perspective that we can just march all through scripture and, and look at all this is when I say that there's nothing you can do to be saved, you can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do. I mean, why did people say that? Huh? Was there not a sense in which Peter was right when he said that in verse 40? Yeah, like, I, mean, I, I guess think we're, we're called to exhort yeah, people and, and do things. Yeah. So I agree that sins were forgiven. Like the blood of Christ shed at the cross, at the cross is what forgives sins. But I think there's like, from two different perspectives, from God's <clears throat> perspective, from man's perspective. Now, I would say this, you know, I would obviously, you're going to be probably much more of an expert on Reformed theology than I have. I've watched quite a bit and read quite a bit from Sproul and MacArthur and Pink and, I mean, James White and all those guys. And maybe you have a favorite that you'd like me. I mean, if you've got a book you want me to read, I mean, I'll read it. Um, See, this is the thing. This is what, to me, I mean, like honestly, an angel, you know, uh, I, there, there's not. I mean, I can read you the scripture. I can read you. I can read you a text out of God's word right now, like yeah. multiple texts yeah. that show you these things. How did you like, tell me, how did you get, ref, refresh my memory? I had asked like how you got into reform theology. I can't remember. So if I misrepresent, tell me, but I was asking, I think when we talked the first time, and by the way, my, I have two monitors. So my logos is here, my camera's here, but my, so if mm -hmm. you see me looking, I'm looking at your face, but the camera's here, but how did you, from being a member of the church, um, what led you like, and you know, I'm trying, I'm not trying to say like what drug you away. I'm just saying, how did you get into the reform stuff? Like, were you, did you read books? Like, did you mm -hmm. come to it on your own? I, did, I thought you mentioned something about going to a bookstore or something. Mm -mm. No, um, <clears throat> I was, um, so I had this hidden sin in my life, right? Um, yeah. that no one knew, no one knew my sin, Aaron, but I did. Yeah. First Corinthians 2. I know my heart. God knows my heart. And I really love Lord. Um, but man, I had this hidden sin. I couldn't confess it. You know why I couldn't confess it? Because, I mean, look, and here's the deal. And, yeah. and, and look, let me just tell you. Yeah, it's okay to ask. I mean, yeah, I'm not yeah, trying yeah, to. No, 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 no. I'm glad you asked. And hopefully people can hang on long enough to hear this part. Maybe I'll just start. We have 20 minutes. If we pause it on accident, it's probably a good um, one. Yeah. So, um, but in the Church of Christ, it's, it's, there, there's unsaid rules. There's unsaid things that are taught that are not really taught blatantly, right? Okay. Um, and, and no one in the Church of Christ admits that. Like, you're not going to admit that, but I have a church full of people who've come from the Church of Christ. I talk to people on a weekly basis across the country who say sure. yes, yes and amen. I had two this week, right? Preachers who've come out of the Church of Christ, they're no longer in the Church of Christ, that say, yep, 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 but now... No one in the Church of Christ admits it. You can't. Okay. Right. Okay. But it's this under deal. Like you can't confess some nasty sins because see, you, you've worked your way up to this level. You're at this spot now. You're a teacher. You're a preacher. Whatever you are, you're an elder or deacon. Whatever. I mean, personally, I I could care less what other people think. In a sense, like if I like on our podcast, there's right. some sin. You know, me and Tucker and Scott. Scott, you know, used to be a drug dealer. Um, I, me and Tucker both have been addicted to pornography when we were younger. And so we talk yeah, about yeah. that stuff. No, 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 no. no. Look, there's no problem yeah. with that. Listen, listen. Let me I'm just saying, I, like, I'm mm -hmm. full. I'm trying to be open and honest with people, no, so they not, don't look. I totally get what you're saying. What you're saying is that was where I was at. Look, nobody had yeah. a spot in leadership or, or that. No one yeah. had an issue with saying I used to struggle with this. I used to have sure. that. I used to. Sure. Oh, but now, like, nah. Now you people need to confess your sins. You people need to do that. But yeah. they, like, the leadership never. I mean, now they'll tell you I used to be a drunk. I got drunk once, you know, and. But no confession, no no continually confessing of, of sins, and it's yeah. because you do that, you 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 all the way back down, start all over from square one, work your way back up. Yeah, I know, I understand. That's why I prefaced it with like, I get you. You don't think that, and you're not going to believe that. Um, but countless of people who've come out, they said, uh, in my own experience, you know, so. I confess my sin before God and man, not just to God, but 
to yeah. my wife, to my friends and everything. And it was just like, I was broken. Right. Yeah. And I was just broken, man. Broken more than I've ever been broken in my life. And, um, I started like, I have a bookshelf, I have a library, I have a Bible study room in my house full of books. And I, I was in there. I was like, okay, what do you people believe? Like, like you said, pink, R.C. Sproul, yeah. Spurgeon, yeah. all these great people in our past history of the Christian faith. I'm talking all of them. I don't care if it's Matt Chandler, whoever, from the recent to the oldest, I got them. And so I'm like, what do y'all believe? Because I know you're not Church of Christ. What do mm -hmm. you? Because I'm at, at this point, I'm like, man, I don't even care. Dude, this is me. This is my sin. Deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I started reading every stinking one of them are Reformed. Now, at the time, I didn't know what that even meant. I didn't know what Reformed was. What is that? We didn't sure. use those terminologies in the Church of Christ. And so yeah. then I started looking into it, and I read this word, oh, my gosh, Calvinism. And I'm like, oh, that's not me. Nope. I know that's wrong. Yeah. But I only know it's wrong because I was told it was wrong. I didn't really yeah. understand it. I didn't know. Any, I, God predestined and it's, it's your robots, you know, and babies go to hell. That's what I believe. And that's what, you know, I think you... You're kind of you're understanding for hearing what you said in one of your podcasts talking about Calvinism that babies go to hell and their sins are not atoned for. That's just a very no, bad I mean, misunderstanding. But yeah, but my I point is I started looking to I was like, let me just see like these people either they're right and I'm wrong or I'm wrong I'm right and they're wrong or we're both wrong. So I started looking into it. I'm reading. I'm like, crap. What do I do with this? Like this is everywhere in Scripture. Like God opened my heart and my eyes because I cried out. I said, like, God, I don't care what. Just tell me who you are. I, what's going on? Right. Mm -hmm. My world was upside down. And so I'm starting to read. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I've, I've read this a thousand, thousands of times. How could I not see that? And guess what? Yeah. Everybody I share with who come from the Church of Christ, and they're, they're like, once God opens their heart and eyes, because we all say that, we all say that, we all pray, God, open their heart, open their eyes. But yet we think it's up to them to open their heart and their eyes. Just mm -hmm. contradiction right there. But God truly does open people's hearts, and he truly does open people's eyes. And when they do, they're like, what? Oh my goodness. I have read mm -hmm. this text millions, thousands, years and years and years. How could I never see that? So when you ask mm -hmm. me, give me a book to read. Well, I mean, I can give you a book to read, but that's not going to do anything. It's just not going to do anything. Isn't, so that how, take, hmm? isn't that what you're saying though? Is you're saying that you, you read, you went to the wherever and read Pink Sproul, whoever, these reformed guys mm -hmm. And when you read them, you saw that Calvinism was true. Yeah, I was so like, broken in my sin. So let me ask you something, Aaron. Do you believe yeah. that God opens people's hearts and God opens people's eyes? Do you believe that? Yeah. I mean, the Bible says that, like Acts 17 with or 16 with Lydia. Mm -hmm. But the question is how. So a lot of that stuff is how does God do this? Right. God gives us a new heart, Ezekiel 36, 25, new spirit. How does he do it? Ezekiel and puts, 18, and, repent and turn. Yeah, yeah. Back to Ezekiel. He puts his spirit in you to cause you to obey him and to follow his rules. He puts his spirit in you to cause you. Yeah. So the question is how though. And that's, right, that's obviously right. The right. The right. Look at this. Is how this do is it, everywhere. You do it My against buddy. your will or does he do it? Do you have a, a part to say in it? Which once again, man, we've got four minutes left. Is that right? Three fifty. Um, yeah, but hold on real quick. I'll show you this here. Well, you is, had said this is my buddy was showing me this today. It's everywhere in scripture. This is Jeremiah 24. When he's seeing, you know, he has these, these groups of figs, right? And sure. he's explaining some figs are good, some are bad. And then the word of the Lord came to me, right? And he said, thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from his place, in the land of Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good. I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart. How are they returning to him with his whole heart, with their whole heart? Because he gave them a new one. He changed their heart. And so, yeah, but the question is how, how did he do it? We'll I mean, the idea, we'll, because, we'll you know, That's a good one. the idea that he brought them Jeremiah writing before they go to Babylonian exile mm -hmm. and they came back to Babylonian exile. Obviously God didn't change everybody's heart because exactly. the people who, were worshiping him, they then went and basically went to Malachi and all that. But so the only thing I'll say in closing, I guess, Which is, then, again, Paul yeah. explains that to us in Romans, but go ahead. Yeah. Nine through 11. Yeah. Um, so I would say this, I would say that, you know, from your perspective, you know, 
you know, you're saying, you know, you left the church and it tore your world up, which I believe that. I mean, you know, I, I it's agree. Great. It that, was great. I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful to God Almighty that I am where well, I am I, now. That if I, that if I left the churches of Christ, which if I thought doctrinally they were wrong, I would do. Cause I, honestly, I'm not in the church of Christ for my family or my friends or my job. I'm in it because I don't want to go to hell. Cause I think it's the truth. Okay, but I'd say that, you know, the idea of saying, um, that, you know, the churches of Christ is a gospel that puts people under bondage and it it's more freeing. Well, I would say if you're right, but if you're wrong, it doesn't. Because no, I'll say I, this. I yeah, because, you know, if you're right and, you know, it's God changed your heart and all these things. Because the things that I hear you and Jeremiah and James White and a lot of these guys, like they say that, you know, this idea that you have to be obedient, you have to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, or you know, you have to, you know, all those things. They say, well, that's a that's a bondage. I don't think it is if it's the truth. Like, if it's the truth, I'm going to follow it. Even if, you know, Jesus mm -hmm. said, take up your cross daily and follow me. He didn't say it's going to be. He said, no, that, look, hey, if Mormonism is true, we should follow it, right? Yeah, we're we're both going to agree it's not true, and I could Right, but they, they say it's true, right? They believe it's true. They're wrong, right? No, they're, wrong. they're wrong. They're wrong. Yeah. So, and this is where me and you get, it, right? Yes. So that's what I'm saying is, you know, we both look at the other and say, well, like, you know, you're from your perspective, you know, you think you're right and then mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Therefore, what we're putting on you is a yoke of bondage. And I'm going to say, you know, you say the Galatian heresy and I'm going to say, no, the Galatian heresy in context is they were binding the law of Moses. That's why he talks in Galatians four about days and months and years. And that's why he talks in about the circumcision and the the big him confronting Peter to his face face. Mm -hmm. like Galatians 2.16. You're saved by faith, not the works of the law. That's talking about the works of the law of Moses. How do you know that it's not talking about any works like you're going to put baptism in there? Because in Galatians 3.24, he starts talking about justification by faith. Mm -hmm. And in verse 26, he says, for you're all sons of God by faith for, that's a different Greek word, that's gar, means mm -hmm. introduce the reason. Gotcha. You're all sons of God by faith for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that's in the explanation of 2.16. Totally. So Paul is explaining 2.16. You're justified by faith, which I think for sure is talking about the system of faith, not the law of Moses. Right. Yeah. And that makes sense because if he's talking about you're justified by belief. Makes sense to you, and, right? Because you've what, what you've believed a thousand times, the lie you've believed a thousand times is easier to believe than the truth you've heard once. Your word. Sure. Right? And so, I would say that it's also possible for my – so either one of us could be wrong. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying like the idea that – I would disagree that what we teach is the Galatian heresy because Paul himself says the Galatian heresy. If you look at the full context of the book, and I know eventually I'll be one day we walk through the book or whatever. Can't wait. Um, Can't wait yeah, to go to exactly. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. But yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is when people say, oh, I left the church of Christ and I don't have that bondage of trying to live faithful anymore. Well, it's only bondage if it's wrong. If it's right and, you know. I look, I look I mean, at the law. Like, let me ask you this real quick. Do you think when yeah. Jesus died, he got rid of the law? Uh, I mean, Matthew five seventeen says that he fulfilled it. He said, I'm, "I came I'm not, not." I'm not asking that. Yeah, he fulfilled the law. But do you think that when he died on the cross, he nailed the law to the cross and got rid of the law? Colossians two fourteen through sixteen. Yeah, right. That's what you believe, because right. that's what the Church of Christ believes. So, well, that's do you wrong. Worship on Sabbath? Do you believe Ten Commandments? Do you worship on the Sabbath? I, I worship on the Lord's Day on Saturday on, on Sunday. Yeah, which yeah. is not the Sabbath. So mm -hmm. you don't follow the Ten Commandments. I mean, well, that was not that's been changed. In a but no, like, <laughs> right? Do you you think murder's wrong? Yeah, of course. It's restated in the New Testament, obviously. So if something's there's not something in the New Testament, we should do it. How about having sex with animals? Uh, well, no. There are certain things that are connected to God's moral nature that have always been wrong, like homosexuality, Genesis eighteen, nineteen, Leviticus twenty, twenty-two. Uh, and but the I would New say Testament. I would say, listen, I understand that you believe, and I I did two podcasts. Go back and watch them. Did Jesus nail the law to the cross, right? Because that's what I was taught in the Church of Christ, and this is what the Church of Christ believed. They, they believe that he, he got rid of the law at the cross. It's bad, man. It's bad. And I got two, two 10, 15, 12-minute uh, episodes on that. I want you to go back and watch that and to see it. Can you text me, can you text me a link to him or something so the I can Parish find The Reformed them? Podcast. Look, you know what you should do? Subscribe. Look at it right there. You should subscribe not, to that. I'll subscribe to you, but I'll go watch your videos. You should subscribe to that and watch that. Uh, and I explained to you Shao, how he didn't, he did not get rid of the law. What he nailed to the cross was our breaking of the law, our sin, our transgressions, and what we owed the law, not the law itself. This is why Paul continues to say the law is good, holy, perfect, righteous, and good. We uphold the law of God, all right? 
How can you uphold it if it's gone? So yeah, I, there's, a lot there. there's a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot there. Verse. But here's, here's the point yeah. is the Christian now looked at the law before he was a Christian. The law showed us that we were short and we failed and we could not sure. live up to the standards of God. Pretty we see deep, Christ, yeah. Christ fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law sure. and he sure. nailed our transgressions of that law to the cross and the guilt and the shame with it. And he truly died for me if I believe in him. And so when I see that now, I look at the law and I don't think of the oppressiveness of it. I look at it and say, oh, perfect, holy, good law. I want to live by it. I want to serve you, Lord Jesus. I want to be like you, right? And if I'm going to be like Christ. Well, you don't follow the law of Moses, though. No. Right? Well, what's the law of Moses? What is it summed up into what? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Do you think we should do no, that? The law, the law of Moses was the Deuteronomy 5 given only to Israel. The now, whole Jesus law. He said the law is some law and the prophets summed up in this love your neighbor as yourself, which so is that from would the sum up the whole law, right? The whole yeah, but that law. yeah, but you I mean you're not obviously you're not going to keep you don't keep the Sabbath. I'm assuming no, 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 you, you don't miss my point. No, no, no. Of course I don't. I don't. I don't sacrifice. Right. So, he used the so fulfillment of that was fulfilled but, by Christ. But the moral law of God, right? The moral laws of God, the things of how we should live in this earth, still yeah, apply. I have no problem. Still apply. Which, which ones, though? Which ones? Well, well, not the sacrificial system. He fulfilled that, and that's done away with, right? Not the, uh, not the temple ordinances and the laws of the temple worship and things like that. He right. fulfilled that. Yeah. But the moral yeah. law of God that sums up all of that, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbors, yourself, that sums up every bit of the law, even the priestly things and even yeah. all those things. It sums up all the law. And so when I'm like Christ, if I'm going to be like Christ, well, Christ fulfilled the law. I don't look to the law. I look to Christ. Oh, you froze. I froze. You froze. I'm frozen. I'm still here. Oh, you're back. You're back. Yes. So my point is if Christ fulfilled the law perfectly and I'm going to be like Christ, then I'm going to be fulfilling the things of the law, not by looking at the law, but by looking to Christ. Okay. We'll talk about that some other time. Yeah. yeah that'd be good. It is a bondage in the church of Christ because it's so all these, you, you know, again, things that are stated but not stated uh, that you have to live like this, 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 you got to be perfect and all this. You can't mess up. You know, but I don't know. You don't preach that. You don't, you're going to say that you don't believe that. You always make a mess up, make mistakes. I get but, it. But you get agree it. too. How many, how many churches of Christ were you associated with? Like, you, weren't you right? Is your dad or some, you're from your family members of the church? And you went to a, yeah, did my, you go to my church? My whole family was Church of Christ, old school Church of Christ. This church, I went to that church. I went my in law, yeah. my wife was Church of Christ. I uh, went to a Church of Christ high school. I went to a church, church of Christ university. Like, and yeah. that's what I get when, when people say, well, you just don't really understand the Church of Christ. I'm like, dude, what, well, what, what I'm can I saying. do? I was raised in the Church of Christ. I went to a high school, college, Church of Christ. You know? I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that you don't understand. I, I'm saying, guess what I said at the beginning, which is obviously Church of Christ are autonomous. There's thousands in the U.S. So mm -hmm. you get a mixed bag. I'm just I travel. About, from the beginning, I'm just talking about being born you perfect, experience. be baptized. You can lose your salvation. Those three. Sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, it does. It does put a yoke of bondage on you. So what was that? I'm down to talk about all three of those tenets. Yeah. And so, um, all right, we got to shut this down. Yes. And we're going to talk about next time the doctrine of the okay. atonement. Uh, okay. What truly happened there? When am I really okay. reconciled to God? Uh, and what else you want to talk? Let's go deeper into baptism and look at those verses and. And faith, the word faith, the, the the definition of faith, the definition of baptism, justification. Well, let me ask you this. There's no way we're going to get through baptism, the atonement, when we're reconciled, deferred, mm -hmm. defining terms, and false gospels next time. Um, do, can we pick up with Acts 2 next time? Just since, and, and as we go through, and especially the doctrine of the atonement, like, I don't know how deep you want to go into that. Like, maybe you and I can talk offline and find out what you exactly want to cover in that. No, I want to go uh, online. I want people to see it. I want people to That's hear fine. the conversation. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the doctrine of atonement. And then, because okay. like, when you don't understand it, you're, you're coming at it from your perspective. And, and when you don't really see the good news, the gospel of what Jesus Christ has done. And this is... I think it's great news. I think, right, right. I, and I, it's the I best think it's news great. you've heard. It's the best news that you know of, right? you got an opportunity to be saved. Like, if you do this and you keep doing these things, then you got a chance. Yeah, but if that's the truth, then it is the best the news. Even if somebody comes along and says, you know, you've been t told that you have to do these things to receive mm -hmm. God's gift. You don't earn it, but you have to do it. Well, if someone comes along and says, hey, you don't have to do anything. 
Like, well, yeah, that's good news, unless it's false. And then it's that like, you know, Colossians. So here's, two, like, here's the thing with legalism, which I would say that you're a part of legalism. When you don't understand the gospel, people always jump from legalism to antinomianism. Antinomianism is I don't have to do anything. God's God's God. There's nothing I can do. I don't have to do anything. No, like Todd Wagner, when you're talking about, he says you don't have to do anything. Well, we're talking about justification. When it comes to justification, you do nothing. You do nothing when it comes to being justified before God Almighty. So well, that's, that's what we're, what we're talking about. Now, once, once you're justified in Christ, guess what you do? You live for Christ. You have a new heart. You have a new spirit. He is guiding you. His, you no longer live. Christ lives in you. How can Christ deny himself? We get into all this stuff that we don't understand. We have no even compartments, especially in the Church of Christ. We just don't. We're not taught any depth, really. You're, you're more studied than any Church of Christ person I can think of or I've ever met or even heard of. Like, I, mean, I just listen to all, I just listen to all the smart guys and write down all the good stuff. There you go. That's what I do. So, But what I'm saying is you still you might have some head knowledge of some things, but I, I want to look in the Scriptures and see what it says, hold you to the fire of your definitions of these terms, and show sure. you that the good news is actually better than you ever dreamed it would be. It really is. And you're free, like truly free. When the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Free. Not when you set so, yourself free. Not so when, you when set yourself so, free. So are we going to pick up in Acts? Are we still going to finish Acts 2? Because if yeah, we're talking about yeah, justification. Yeah. No, 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 no. Wanna, about, yeah. When yeah. a person's sins are forgiven, right? Yeah. I mean. But you know, before I talk, go we, to Acts 2 with you, I want to explain to you the doctrine of the atonement. Okay. Okay. Old Testament, New Testament, how they were saved, how's everybody saved, you know? Yeah. Want to discuss you that? Huh? Did you uh, say wait hopefully, an hour? Hopefully next week sometime. Oh, I thought you just said, like, I want to explain to you. I'm like, well, that's fine. You can oh, no, now, but I, I, I've got to go. I'm already late. But uh, yeah. next week we'll do, hopefully, uh, uh, the Doctrine of Atonement. And uh, I'll try to put this up in, like, probably five segments or something. Just cut it up and let people know, like, yeah. we're talking about this here. We're talking about this here. Uh, I don't know if, when I'll get that up. I, it probably won't be until yeah. next week. In a rush, like I'm not going to be the one that's like, you better have it up next week. No, so I mean, you can put it up on your end whenever you get it done. When I get time, yeah, yeah, and that's me too. So I just want everybody to know that I do love you, Aaron, and I do feel like you love me. I, I respect you. I, do. I respect. I think you. you respect me. I appreciate mm -hmm. this. You know, I've I've said some hard things, and and I did apologize for the one thing I came across as a turd to you for. No, so compared, to, I'm sure compared to most people I talk to, you're like, you know, you're passive. So well, don't worry. I want yeah. to be respectful and. You know, I agree. And so, I want to. Um, when I do come across that way, I do apologize. I don't want to. Um, yeah, so I want yeah, people to see that we can have these discussions, challenge each other, right? Yeah. And uh, but in prayerfully and hopefully seriously, that we really are treat, you know seeking truth. And if it costs us everything, then it costs sure. us. So like, you know, I quit my job. We planned a church. I went back to seminary. If if it costs me to lose, like, oh hey, but see, I've eaten crow. I've I've admitted that everything I was taught, everything I preached was wrong. Like, sure, I, I still got the taste of crow in my mouth, so it's no big deal. Sure. But it w I'm just telling you, it will be a high price for you to pay if you said, you know sure. what? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You would lose everything. And it, it and but that's what Jesus tells us. He said you will lose everything if you're willing to doubt yourself. Sure. Pick up your cross and follow me. So love you. We'll, we'll do this again. And I'll call you here in a minute once we stop this and discuss how awesome this was. Sounds good, dude. You want to say anything? You want to end with anything? Just uh, if any of you gluttons for punishment made it this whole, what, three hours, then good for you. And I'm thankful that you're concerned about spiritual things and the fact that you're willing to take the time to watch this. And, you know, you could be doing a lot of other things with three hours of your time. So the fact that you're trying to dive into God's word and listen to two sides and go from there, I think is, is pretty awesome. So that's good. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. And we'll talk soon. All right. See you, Trey. All right. Bye bye. See you.